So happy to be here. Um, the Pascal has done quite well uh, what I've done in uh, my last 30 years. So this is uh, sort of also anniversary for me. I mean, it was the year of graduation. In reality, we know each other from 86 when I started the, 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 uh, the uh, um, and uh, um, as I say, I work for the European Commission. At the moment, I'm detached to the European External Action Service, so I'm a sort of uh, diplomat uh, post in Washington. And uh, um, I'll try not to do a presentation too much diplomatic, uh, because I don't know if you know, but uh, the, the definition of diplomat is somebody who thinks twice before saying nothing. <laughs> and that could be a little bit uh, uh, boring. Um, but since I will try to say a little bit more than nothing, uh, I also to say that what I will say uh, uh, reflects my own thought and doesn't necessarily reflect uh, uh, the position of uh, the European Union. Um, so having said that, the, the, the topic that I'm going and I will ask to develop is the economic policy of the Trump administration. This is part of my daily job at the delegation where I report to the Brussels headquarters what is going on in the United States uh, and what has happened in particular in this last year. I mean, I arrived in Washington uh, at the end of December of 2015 when the electoral campaign had just started and I had the opportunity to look uh, uh, at the electoral campaign itself and what has followed and I have to say that uh, um, there was never a, a dull moment uh, in the last two years. It's been pretty, pretty interesting. But before uh, going, and I, so I can show you the, um, the structure of my presentation, in order to understand uh, uh, um, the economic policy of the current administration, you have a little bit to have a step back first to look at the Great Recession and uh, the eight year of the Obama's presidency and how uh, um, uh, first before candidate Trump and after President Trump came into the picture uh, after in the after crisis period. Um, so I will look first uh, at the candidate Trump to explain what were the uh, underlying uh, elements of uh, his uh, economic policy proposals and also because it's important who advised him um, on, uh, on, on his uh, uh, economic program. Um, after that, as it happens to everybody, not only in the case of Trump, you, when you become president, uh, you have to face reality, uh, difficult constraint, you have to deal uh, with Congress, uh, uh, which is a complicated body, not as complicated as the European Union, but still uh, is quite complicated. And uh, um, so, and looking at the successes uh, and failures of the first uh, uh, 10 months, and uh, I will, in the final part, dedicate an important part of the presentation to the tax reform that will probably be approved uh, in the coming days because this is major deliverable probably of uh, the uh, Trump administration in terms of economic policy during the first mandate and uh, because uh, it has important uh, aspects both in, the, in terms of um, economics and economic poli policy but also of political economy. And finally, uh, I will look at the challenges ahead for uh, the Trump administration. And after we will open, there will be two discussions. Uh, and, uh, uh, and after, uh, we will open to the general discussion. So, the Great Recession posed a number of challenges to uh, uh, President Obama, who came uh, into power when uh, uh, the Great Depression was in full swing. The economy was collapsing at the same speed uh, that you had in the 30s. Uh, GDP uh, uh, was declining at a, pa at a pace of 4 to 5% uh, uh, per quarter. Uh, unemployment uh, uh, 
was growing and uh, approaching 10% of the labor force, uh, inequalities. Uh, well, initially, when you have a, a great crisis, inequalities goes down because the collapse of the rich people uh, collapse faster than uh, the one of uh, uh, the people who have uh, uh, um, lower incomes. Uh, but I mean, as soon as the recovery starts, you could see that there was inequality <laughs> rising. Um, and also inequalities, uh, in particular in the case of the United States, if you go beyond the uh, income, but you look at everything, uh, healthcare insurance, uh, uh, unemployment, the risk of uh, uh, um, being uh, excluded and uh, uh, becoming homeless uh, is quite high, uh, independently of still you get some income or not. Um, there was a drastic decline in the world trade and, uh, uh, of course, huge financial instability. Uh, to address this issue, uh, uh, the Obama presidency, in particular in the first two years, made a number, uh, took a number of uh, measures. Uh, on the one hand, there was a strong support on the demand through the America uh, Recovery and Reconstruction Act uh, that uh, uh, include uh, of $787 billion, uh, about 4% uh, uh, of GDP, uh, to be spent not in one year, but over uh, uh, two years. There was uh, uh, something that the United States don't do often, but in difficult period they do. They intervene to rescue uh, the car sector to avoid the complete collapse of the, uh, uh, of the car industry. The, uh, um, there were efforts to um, uh, uh, address the raise inequalities. Um, on the one hand, the, uh, the president signed a number of objective orders to strengthen the, the union so that to have uh, uh, employees to have a, a, a stronger uh, a bargaining power. Uh, and uh, although that was not the main uh, objective introduced of the so-called Obamacare, a, s a system that should have, uh, uh, if not ensure univers universal health insurance, uh, uh, at least to reduce dramatically the number of people who had not uh, health insurance, but that had also uh, significant uh, uh, redistribution effect because part of it was financed by higher taxes uh, on high-income people. Um, interestingly, in the, the uh, uh, Obamacare, Democrats have never tried to sell it uh, as uh, a uh, redistributive uh, 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 policy. And uh, I asked them why, and they said, well, I mean, in the opinion poll that we have done, I mean, people didn't appreciate that uh, the thing. But, I mean, it was, and it is partly also a redistributive policy. And, uh, um, in terms of financial stability, they passed the Dodd-Frank Act that introduced all a set of new rules uh, for the financial institution to avoid uh, and to reduce the risk of financial crisis. Uh, and finally, uh, in order to tackle the decline of world trade, uh, he, uh, uh, he, the, the Obama administration tried to introduce a new generation of trade deals, uh, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, that was agreed uh, among between the, the United States uh, and uh, a number of Asian countries. There were discussions to have something similar, the TTIP, uh, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership uh, between Europe and the United States, that was never concluded because uh, uh, um, the negotiations were still on when uh, 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 Obama had to step down. They would probably have continued if Hillary Clinton was elected, but that was not the case, so um, that collapsed. The, the objective uh, was to, I will not go through the entire thing, let's say that the, uh, the, the squares are the uh, uh, policy initiatives uh, that were taken. The objective was to have a multi-pronged recovery driven by demand on the one hand, uh, increase of investment on the other, and uh, uh, um, increase in productivity related also to the change of the productive system of the United States with a lot of emphasis on high-tech and green economy 
uh, and much less emphasis on the more traditional uh, industrial sector. Um, the, uh, the stronger growth would have led to full employment uh, and uh, full employment together with a strengthening of the bargaining power of the unions and the workers would have led uh, to higher wages and therefore in that way a sort of uh, a virtuous circle that uh, would have uh, created stronger growth, higher investment, higher productivity. Um, there, were, there were winners and losers, as usual, when you have uh, to take decisions and, and do policies. So the winners were the coastal areas, where the high-tech industry and uh, the, uh, um, also the green economy was more developed. Uh, High-skilled workers, uh, uh, their wages went up, uh, continued to go up, while the general median wages uh, um, and uh, uh, medium wages uh, were stagnating for high skilled workers, they went up. Um, government employees, uh, they were, I mean, they didn't have big uh, wage increases, but I mean, the, uh, uh, they were, uh, they had job security and uh, uh, the um, and after the initial crisis uh, that had many people in the states fired because the states were facing budget constraint they were rehired and that uh, uh, went well and over the medium term uh, you could say that uh, uh, minorities unionized workers in large companies uh, uh, would have benefited from uh, the measures uh, that uh, uh, the Obama administration took, for instance, the minorities through the Affordable Care Act uh, could get uh, a much higher uh, uh, share of people covered by uh, the uh, 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 health insurance, but he also took a number of initiatives in order to uh, um, uh, help minorities to uh, uh, get better integrated in the social fabric of the United States. The same unionized workers once full employment was back, probably they would have been able to uh, have a stronger bargaining powers. There were also uh, losers or at least partial losers. I would say partial losers in the sense that, uh, I mean, had there been another administration in place, they would have got a, probably a better deal. Um, sorry, the last uh, uh, group that uh, was gaining was the farmers, in general not a group that uh, uh, vote for uh, the Democrats, but uh, um, the United States, when they negotiate, they negotiate pretty hard to open uh, uh, the agricultural markets in other parts of the world, and in general that proves beneficial uh, to the farmers. Um, the losers, I mean, they, they, they were the U.S. Uh, uh, inner areas, uh, so the, the, the ones that are not the coastal areas, uh, you have probably all heard about the uh, horror stories on the Appalachian people that sometimes they live in, in real poor uh, uh, conditions uh, and uh, um, where the industry, uh, uh, the old industrial uh, uh, sector has collapsed and there are very high rate unemployment and people that simply abandon the labor market and don't try to, to get back. Um, retailers are also hit, I mean, the, the, high, the new, the high-tech industry, the, new, the Amazons and so on, I mean, they are very effective, they hire people, but uh, they are uh, uh, destroying small, uh, small retailers uh, and department stores, and you see more and more uh, retailers and department stores getting out of jobs. Uh, Wall Street is not that, I mean, we have to cry for them. I mean, they are not in a bad situation. But of course, I mean, the, uh, the Dodd-Frank Act put all a set of restrictions uh, on things that they could do and couldn't do. And therefore, the, for a while, uh, uh, you had less wolves, wolfies in Wall Street than you had in the past. And I mean, the, um, the top desires of income earners uh, uh, were paying because in part they were paying for the health insurance uh, reform. In part, I mean, uh, in 2013, Obama was able to extend the tax cut that uh, uh, George Bush uh, had introduced in 2001 for all the categories apart from 
the uh, top income uh, people where they reversed to uh, the bracket that existed before the tax cut of Bush and, uh, and that had uh, uh, a pretty significant impact uh, um, on the uh, um, and for a while the inequalities declined not much but I mean they, they, there was a reverse on the trend you can see uh, uh, the Gini coefficient as I said when you have uh, 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 a big recession initially the inequalities go down but after they go up but between 2013 and 2015 uh, um, also because of these policies, uh, 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 they went down temporarily, but uh, uh, was one of the outcomes. So and that allows me to go for one second to uh, what were the outcomes. I mean, you've seen the graph that you had uh, before. That was what was hoped, but uh, in the real world, never things go exactly as you hope that will go. So there was uh, uh, the recovery, uh, but it was relatively slow in terms of growth, also by historical standards. Uh, in a way, the stars never aligned. Uh, there was political uncertainty at the beginning of the recovery with the risk of the government shutdown. Um, the global economy uh, recover much slowly than was initially expected. There was a sovereign debt crisis in Europe. Uh, all this represented a headwind uh, also for the US economy. Uh, the, um, the financial conditions uh, uh, tightened a certain moment uh, because of the, the beginning of the tapering of monetary policy uh, in 2013. And you had the boom and boost of the energy sector. I mean, the US did well in 2011, 2012, uh, because there was a boom in the energy sector that, uh, that drove up uh, investment and also in part uh, consumption. And after you had the boost and uh, uh, all this uh, uh, slowed the economy in the following year. So, I mean, you didn't have everything aligned in order to allow the growth to be, I mean, you didn't go into recession, but the growth never become strong, was always uh, uh, moderate. Um, the, uh, there was a steady decline in unemployment that uh, was here but doesn't appear. Um, but there was also a decline in the labor force participation. Uh, the stock market, I mean, is doing well with uh, President Trump, but it did quite well also uh, under President Obama. Um, and uh, uh, Wages, as I mentioned, apart from the high segment of wages stagnated uh, and there were some losses for low skilled workers. And finally, as I said, uh, income inequalities increased, um, but the trend was partly reversed in 2013, from 2013 to 2015. And now we come and I mean the uh, Obama thought that he would have passed the baton to somebody else, uh, but he went to Trump. And uh, I think that the, uh, the cartoon describes quite well uh, what happened. I mean, the, the Trump ran in a very different direction than the one that uh, Obama had taken. Um, so we arrived in 2015, and there is the announcement by President Trump, uh, that, uh, by future President Trump, that he would be candidate, uh, and would be candidate in a rather uh, unconventional uh, uh, um, platform compared to its uh, 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 Republican peer candidates. Um, so already, I mean, he's uh, uh, um, uh, a rather unconventional figure, um, and he decided to run on a populistic, uh, economic, nationalist, uh, anti-free trade economic platform. Uh, there were 17 candidates at the beginning, and uh, uh, only three of them had uh, 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 no real political experience and never held uh, office uh, uh, before. Um, and many thought uh, that, in reality, the candidate of the Republican Party would be Jeb Bush. Um, on the other hand, I mean, there, there was also a surprise in Democratic primaries. I mean, there were <coughs> uh, only three candidates there, 
Everybody expected that Hillary Clinton, uh, with, who had an enormous advantage in terms of uh, fundraising and so on, would ease, uh, easily win. But instead, uh, a major uh, um, challenge was uh, uh, put up by Bernie Sanders, that uh, he was an independent senator and still an independent senator from Vermont. He, he self auto defined self democratic socialist. Um, and, uh, um, and like in the case of Donald Trump, I mean, the, the, um, he had a, a very uh, ambitious economic program where the numbers didn't adapt, adapt but it was able to appeal strongly uh, to, uh, 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 e, uh, to the left basis of Democratic Party, as well as midterms voters, students, not this because he was uh, asking to eliminate uh, uh, the uh, tuition fee for colleges uh, and so on. And he did uh, uh, extremely well in the primaries, uh, uh, challenging and putting Hillary Clinton in, uh, in, in difficulty. I will not go through why she lost. I mean, you, you probably will have the PowerPoint presentation. Um, there are two things that, uh, however, for the future will be uh, quite interesting to keep in mind. One is that uh, um, just, I mean, the, the she was running ahead and uh, uh, ev almost everybody expected that uh, uh, she would uh, uh, win the elections. Um, I had some doubts and I want to launch this betting on Trump. Um, the, um, but the, the two things uh, that uh, uh, are important here is that on the one hand, she had a well-polished program. I mean, the, where everything was thought uh, to uh, show that uh, she would run the country in a cautious way. She would uh, support uh, economic growth, but would avoid uh, an increase in debt. Uh, but was a program that uh, lacked uh, uh, let's say, measures and proposals that were appealing to the voters. So if you look at uh, um, the Hillary Clinton uh, scoring of uh, what have been the effect of his promises on the, on the debt and what you have, uh, uh, what would have been the impact of the uh, Trump promises on the, on the debt, you can see that Hillary Clinton practically, if you take the baseline scenario, was exactly the same. So the, she was not creating any additional deficit and uh, the debt would have increased mostly because of the social uh, uh, security programs. On the other hand, Trump had the debt exploding, um, but he had uh, proposals that resonated much more of the, uh, than, than Hillary. The other thing is that uh, um, the, uh, uh, at the end of the campaign, Hillary faced, uh, I mean, the Obamacare faced a number of problems because premiums started to raise in a number of, of states, uh, raised quite strongly. And therefore, suddenly, just one month before the elections, Obamacare the majority of uh, Americans consider that uh, uh, had a negative opinion of it. The thing will change uh, and we will see after the, the elections, but that uh, damaged her chances of, uh, uh, of being elected. And so you had, uh, as I said, on the one hand, you had a very thought through, carefully staged, uh, um, uh, really uh, very detailed economic program, um, by the way, that was also a redistributed, one of the biggest redistributive program that uh, a democratic candidate ever had in, uh, uh, in an electoral campaign. Um, and on the other end, uh, but it was based on things that, let's say, were not appealing. I mean, the uh, you will use this money to uh, retrain miners uh, in West Virginia who are, have lost or they will lose their job. But I mean, these miners are in their 40s, in their 50s. And I mean, for them, it was not appealing to do a training course and learn 
uh, new skills, uh, let's say, on computer science. I mean, they say, I mean, our children will do, in any case, much better than us. We want to, to be binaries, and we don't want to, uh, uh, to get new skills and to move to California or to move to another place. Um, while Trump was promising, I mean, we will uh, uh, abandon the Paris Agreement and uh, we will uh, reopen miners and not only you, but also your children okay, will be able to extract the coal. Um, and I mean, that, that was for many people much more appealing. I mean, I say coal, that is not big, but uh, you can say traditional industry, you can say steel. Um, you can say uh, mom and pop's uh, retail store and, and so on and so forth. Um, so um, Trump didn't have a wealth policy and, and coherent economic program. Uh, the promise of a sustainable, he promised that the growth could be uh, uh, go again very high, ab above 4%, sometimes even 6 um, By the way, he mentioned again 6% uh, two days ago, speaking of the impact of the, uh, of the tax reform. Um, and, uh, um, and as I said, if applied literally, it would have created an explosion of the federal deficit and debt, uh, but it was an instrument to vehiculate his message on political and policy priorities, leaving to Congress the task of uh, squaring the circle on issues such as repeal and replace of Obamacare, the tax reform, tax cut, and the, and the budget. So, I mean, I want to do tax reform. I have this big proposal that uh, 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 breaks down the, the federal government, but I don't know, I know that we'll, in the end, we will have to negotiate with the Congress, uh, and therefore will be smaller, so we'll see that uh, everything uh, will go fine. But you have my message, I want to cut taxes, I want to repeal and replace Obamacare. After when they asked, but yeah, but you will uh, replace with, with what? I mean, he was unable to, to spell it out because say, but that is also something that Congress will, will look into that. And that was uh, a strategy that uh, in an year of, uh, um, let's say, insurgency against Washington uh, uh, paid off. Um, and it was also an eclectic program, so there were issues that uh, uh, were traditional Republican, so the regulation, uh, repeal and replace of, of Obamacare, um, the uh, uh, cut in income taxes. There were other issues that on which he was very uh, close to Bernie Sanders, for instance, trade or at least in the headline, uh, big investment infrastructure. Uh, on other issues, l sometimes he looked like uh, uh, more of a Democrat compared to some of his uh, Republican candidates. Um, uh, for instance, on entitlement, pensions, uh, childcare support. Um, where I disagree with this graph, uh, corporate taxes and repatriation of foreign taxes has never been a sort of uh, conservative globalist. I would rather move it, the, the two spot there in uh, conservative and nationalist. But that is uh, a small dissent. But you can see that, I mean, there is a lot of eclecticity. It's not uh, the typical Republican program where you would find 90% uh, of the dots uh, on uh, uh, the uh, top uh, uh, right square is rather scattered. Uh, in various, and that was a little bit of his strength in able to uh, attract some voters uh, uh, from the Democratic side that uh, um, were attracted by proposal of trade protectionism uh, or uh, um, yeah, the, the, uh, keeping the welfare while the Republican traditional were uh, arguing the opposite. Who was advising at the time uh, um, during the campaign uh, President Trump, future President Trump? So there were three groups. There were the old uh, Reagan supply siders, uh, people uh, mostly are people that come from journalism rather than, uh, um, uh, uh, than economics, but 
uh, they were, um, let's say, um, they were involved in the past in the Trump administration, people like Larry Kudlow, Steve Moore, David Malpass, and they worked in particular on tax reform, tax cuts. They were Wall Street operatives, despite the fact that at a certain moment Trump also promised to reintroduce the class Steagall Act and very strong regulation in the financial markets. In reality, I mean, was never on the table. Uh, so there were people like Steve Mnuchin, the current uh, uh, Treasury Secretary, Gary Cohn, uh, who was the Chief Financial Officer of uh, uh, um, Goldman Sachs. Uh, uh, both Mnuchin and Goldman uh, and Cohn both come from Goldman in any case, and they had a career in Goldman. Or Carl Heiken, who is a, a big uh, um, uh, investor in Wall Street. And they were working mostly on financial deregulation. Um, and uh, in a way, they were considered a proxy of uh, mainstream uh, economists, but they were not mainstream economists themselves. And the third were the economic nationalists. I mean, you've probably heard of Steve Bannon, the chief strategist in the White House uh, until August last year, but also people like Wilbur Ross, uh, who is the Commer uh, Secretary, and Peter Navarro, who is the head of the National Trade Council, who, I mean, have this view of uh, uh, trade protectionism, the need of introduce, uh, of introduce uh, protective measures to avoid uh, that uh, the um, US economy is hollowed out uh, and China profits from uh, uh, unfair uh, agreements uh, on trade, as well as Mexico, the European Union, and most of the rest of the world. Um, interestingly, from this group, uh, where the people who were excluded were the mainstream Republican economists, who had already aligned at the beginning of the electoral campaign uh, to Jeb Bush, and that, uh, um, I mean, the, the uh, President Trump has not, is not really in love with economists. So uh, the, 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 the only economist there uh, is uh, uh, Peter Navarro, um, although many people, many people say that Harvard should withdraw his degree to him. Um, uh, but uh, that, is the, uh, that is the only economist that uh, is in the group. And I mean, and not, and here I made only a few examples of people, but uh, there were many more and you have almost no economists. So if you are doing economics, you have not a big future in the, in the Trump administration. Um, the, the other interesting thing, and uh, will come back in the uh, other part of the narrative, is that uh, uh, the Republican Congress uh, were not convinced at all that they would win the presidential election. And so they took a rather extraordinary measure and come up with their own economic program that had overlappings with the Trump program, but was not the same thing. And, and Paul Ryan called it a better way. Um, so it, it was mainly on five points. Uh, that they are, that, as I say, they have overlapping, so there is tax reform, but uh, the initial idea was that it would be budget neutral. So if you have uh, tax cut, you would have also spending cuts and also increase in revenues coming from elimination of deduction and other things. So it should have been as much as possible budget neutral. Uh, repeal and replace of Obamacare, that was their strong point. In a way, you could say that uh, they push even more than Trump to have that. Um, they had the regulation and that Trump, they were perfectly aligned uh, with Trump. Uh, reform of the social security system, instead they went further than Trump had, as we have seen before, Trump in that respect uh, was rather uh, globalist, uh, but also liberal, and uh, while the, the, the Republicans, uh, uh, the dot of uh, entitlement or child care, you would have found in the, in, on, the, on the other square. And, uh, um, and last but not least, uh, they had a free trade agenda that was absolutely not part of the uh, Trump administration. So already when Trump comes into office, I mean, the, the Republicans in Congress were party with him, but not completely convinced. And that has been a source of tension uh, all over the first 10 months of the administration. So facing reality, the first 10 months of the Trump administration, 
Trump arrives in, uh, um, in the White House, he creates his team, and it's interesting that uh, the equilibrium of power that we have seen before the election changes immediately after the election. So there are two winners and one loser. So the winners are the Wall Street operatives, that they get uh, the major jobs, uh, Cohn at the National Economic Council, that is extremely powerful to coordinate the economic policy of the White House. Mnuchin the, becomes the Treasury Secretary, and the ICANN becomes the President of the Special Advisor of Financial Regulation, or the regulation if you prefer. Um, the other winners are the economic nationalists, Bannon. Bannon becomes chief uh, White House Chief Strategist. Uh, Ross becomes the Secretary of Commerce, and Navarro becomes the National Trade Council. Uh, and therefore, this could indicate that I mean, the, the, uh, a, a much aggress aggressive uh, uh, trade policy was in the making. The losers, and that reflects in a way uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the thing, so the, the, the dispute on trade, uh, economic nationally wins on the Reagan supply siders. So they are excluded because they are too much free trader. And therefore, um, the only one who gets something is uh, uh, David Malpas, who becomes the Secretary of Treasury for uh, International Affairs. But Larry Kadlo, who was tipped to become the Council of Economic Advisor, the, press, the Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisor, doesn't get the job. And Steve Moy doesn't even mention for uh, any position. And interesting economists still out. I mean, they uh, continue to remain mainstream economists, although Republicans continue to remain quite unpopular. So the, it's difficult to say with the Trump administration whether there is a sequencing, but you can guess that there is something like that. Um, the, um, the first priority is because they can da be done very fast, is that dismantle the regulation of the Obama administration in crucial areas such as energy, financial sector, environment, uh, education, and labor relations. Uh, repeal and replace Obamacare, where the Republican Congress had assured Trump that they would be able to do that by April. And uh, more in general, the idea of uh, uh, Steve Bannon was to dismantle the administrative state uh, by starving many departments uh, of uh, the federal administration and many in many cases not to replace the personnel and not uh, to uh, uh, send uh, uh, high level people to, le to lead uh, this department. Um, and in a second, and uh, sorry, the other is withdraw from the TPP that, that could be done as Congress had uh, not ratified it, could be done very rapidly by decision by the president. And in a second stage, uh, tax reform and tax cut, uh, investment infrastructure, if there, there was money, and uh, maybe some trade retaliatory measures against uh, countries that have large trade surpluses, on which uh, the Commerce Department and the USTR started a number of studies uh, to see where uh, possible action was, pos was uh, 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 envisible. Um, so the regulation was and has been so far, until we will see the tax reform, the regulation has been the uh, main deliverables uh, and has been done in, in many areas. Energy, environment, financial services, labor relations, consumer protection, safety standards, and so on and so forth. Um, is the um, financial regulation, is the Dodd-Frank Act at risk? Uh, in itself, not, because they need 60 votes in the Senate to repeal uh, uh, the Dodd-Frank. But the Dodd-Frank leaves a lot of margin for implementation to uh, the people who are in charge, the people who are in charge of the financial uh, regulatory agencies. Uh, and uh, uh, in this respect, uh, the, uh, um, uh, there have been cha changes in uh, various departments and so on, and they put people that uh, are much more in favor of uh, less regulation and less stringent supervision. So in a way, the Dodd-Frank is not at risk, but uh, uh, is clearly weakened compared to the Obama years. Um, the, um, is there a protection in trade agenda? I mean, the, the one of the first things that he did was moving away from 
TPP, so the Tran Trans-Pacific uh, uh, Partnership, and, uh, uh, and to start an after negotiations. And uh, the, ne the negotiations are not going particularly well, and so there is the risk that uh, in the not so distant future, the US could move out. Um, to be noted that this is, uh, let's say, the way in which President Trump is used to negotiate. So say, I will draw from uh, Paris, I will come to Paris in a minute, or to the Paris Climate Agreement, or I will draw from uh, uh, NAFTA, or I will draw from the Dreamers or DACA, so the people who have moved when we were very young in the United States and that uh, uh, are allowed to stay there through an a, 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 um, executive order of the president. So I say, I, I will draw from it because so I put you with the shoulder against the wall and uh, you will have to do concessions so that I can uh, uh, get what I want. Uh, but what if the others don't concede, don't, are not ready to make a compromise with you? And that is. Uh, one of the challenges, so we'll see what happens with NAFTA negotiation. Um, China has been a little bit the question mark because, I mean, China should have been named currency manipulator from day one. Um, to be noted that that is nothing, I mean, it's, it's, in the, uh, uh, it's not something that only Trump has done in the past. Mitt Romney in 2012 had the same thing, say that if I'm elected president, the first thing I will do is declare China currency manipulator, although at the time for probably there were stronger reasons than uh, more recently. Um, and uh, um, it also threatened a number of uh, uh, actions against China if the trade deficit, uh, uh, barata trade deficit, had gone down. But for the time being, has not happened. And the question is, will it happen in the future? Is that related to what's going on in, in, in North Korea? I mean, that remains a question mark and we'll have to see. Um, there is the threat of uh, protection measures on steel and aluminium uh, that could come soon. I mean, the groundwork by the Commerce Department and the USTR has been made, but a decision has not been taken yet. And after the, <coughs> the administration commissioned a set of reports on countries that have large trade surplus vis-a-vis -vis the United States, with the idea of asking for remedial action, but also there everything is leaping. The reports are ready under the consideration of the top level administration, but there's not been follow up. So this is an area where something could come up after the election and we can discuss after in the, in the general discussion. The uh, uh, withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement uh, um, is a little bit in the logic that I said of negotiation. So it's a bad deal for the reason that are uh, listed here that I mean, they are based on rather questionable study of a very conservative think tank. Um, on the other hand, uh, does it matter uh, in the sense that 34 of the 50 states of the United States have taken commitments to uh, reach the target they are set for their state uh, uh, in the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, so in partly you could say that the states uh, mitigate uh, the decision at the federal level of withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. On the other hand, I mean the repeal, uh, I mean the, it's not only the withdrawal from the Paris Agreement, but the repeal of a number of decisions taken by the, uh, uh, and the executive order of the Obama administration, like the Clean po Power Act, uh, makes it difficult for the United States to reach the objective, even if the first 34 states. And the other thing is that the incentives have changed dramatically. And if therefore there were in the past strong uh, incentives in favor of clean energy, uh, green economy, clean power, and so on, now, I mean, the incentives are rather moved in favor of uh, uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, say fuel subs uh, um, uh, fuel generated energy and so on, and therefore emission of CO2 uh, is is going up. So I mean, the uh, despite the 
the, the 34 states are co still committed to reach uh, the uh, targets of the Paris Agreement, uh, uh, the, the, the change in direction is, quite, is pretty significant. Um, so um, let me move to the final part of the first 10 months, that is the repeal and replace of Obamacare, that has been the biggest uh, 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 defeat for the uh, um, uh, for the Republican Congress and for the administration. As I said, before the elections, uh, there were problems, and uh, Obamacare was uh, uh, unpopular. Uh, it has become popular after that uh, uh, people uh, discovered what the Republicans uh, were proposing as replacing it. Uh, and a little bit this uh, uh, cartoon reflects well uh, 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 the, the problem. I mean, for the Republicans, it was mostly an ideological problem even before a, a practical problem of how to fix various things on which uh, post, post the, 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 uh, a bilateral, a bipartisan agreement uh, uh, could have been possible uh, because Obamacare, after the, the problem in the autumn of uh, 2016, uh, uh, was improving and so it was getting better. And in fact, I mean, there's been and, and that, that is the quotation from Lindsey Graham, um, say, here is the choice for America, socialism or federalism when it comes to your health care. So, I mean, the, 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 the idea was that Obamacare was the first step of making the United States a socialist country, um, which is a little bit Maybe too much, but that, that has been the, uh, I mean, th th that is the, the conviction that uh, uh, a lot of Republicans have about, uh, uh, and I mean, there was a very strong ideological fight on that in, in 2010. And I mean, in the US care, healthcare sector is huge. I mean, 60% of GDP uh, means that it's bigger than the GDP of Italy. Um, and a huge interest. I mean, the, the biggest uh, lobby group in, uh, Washington DC is not defense, uh, uh, is not chemicals, uh, it is uh, uh, not energy, it is uh, healthcare. Um, so uh, the, uh, the aim, and as I say, the, the, the Republicans substantially failed because their opposition was uh, uh, ideological and never came with a plan, alternative plan that was sufficiently credible that could be sold uh, to the voters. And they had huge problem and they became extremely unpopular. And the only effect that they had was to make Obamacare popular uh, and to recover from the uh, initial problems that he had. Um, so after the failure of Obamacare, there was a new big reshuffle in the administration. Steve Bannon, uh, was ousted with some of the old guard, not all nationalists. So there was previous, there was the chief of staff, Spicer, that uh, was the spokesperson, Gorka, that was a sort of uh, advisor on in international issues. Um, in a way, Gary Cohn, the, the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisor and uh, Wall Street Operative was Transen's position and uh, uh, one of the strengths is related to the fact that uh, Peter Navarro, economic nationalist, was put under him. Um, and uh, um, on the other hand, I mean, the, the Cohn made the mistake uh, from a personal political viewpoint of criticizing President Trump of what happened in Charlottesville in the, in, in the, um, where a person was killed uh, in, uh, in fights between uh, white uh, uh, Ku Klux Klan and a couple of other right, ultra-right uh, ultra people and people who were protesting against him. So uh, it's not clear whether Cohn will survive for long after the passage of the tax reform. Um, so in all this, the big winner was probably the Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, who has grown stronger in this position. Um, and, uh, um, but the issue remains whether economic nationalism has been abandoned or put on hold. I would rather argue that has been put on hold. 
and we will have to see. I mean, the president still sp speaks regularly to Steve Bannon, so it's not that they have severed the links. And uh, um, in many aspects, he remains convinced that uh, uh, an economic nationalist platform is, uh, is necessary for the United States uh, to be great again, as he uses to say. So now the question comes is uh, why, despite uh, the major defeat on Obamacare and the small deliver, uh, deliverable that uh, has been able to do, I mean, the, the economy is doing fine. It's doing, I mean, the, it has grown 3% in the second quarter, 3.3% in the, in the third quarter. And uh, the issue here is that, uh, you remember before I said that the star never aligned for President Obama. If you had the, the boom in the energy sector, you had the political uncertainty at the same time and the sovereign debt crisis in Europe. Um, if you had the, uh, the end of the sovereign debt crisis in Europe, you have the bust of the energy sector uh, and uh, you have the starting of the tightening of financial conditions and so on and so forth. Well, stars aligns just when President Trump becomes president, when the uh, candidate Trump becomes president. So you have that uh, the, um, there is a strong surge in the uh, um, stock market. You could say that partly is, is merit, um, also because anticipating the tax reform. But it's also because there is uh, an acceleration in growth in the entire uh, uh, global economy. For two years in a row, and if you take this year in per capita terms, Europe grows faster than the United States. Um, the entire world is uh, pushing, and therefore this is pushing also the US economy. Um, financial conditions that were tightened because uh, uh, people expected that the Fed would tighten monetary policy much faster and the dollar would appreciate changes. And therefore, in 2015, Goldman Sachs has calculated, sorry, in 2000. Uh, 16 Goldman Sachs calculated financial condition took away one percentage point of growth to the US economy. This year it's at the one percentage point of growth. Um, so you had everything, the stars were perfectly aligned and the economy it is doing fine. So the, the, even if you have some uncertainty, even if you have some defeats, I mean the uh, uh, the, the, the you have such strong uh, uh, tailwinds that uh, help the economy to uh, have uh, a quite dec decent performance, a growth that this year I mean, is estimated at around 2.3, 2.4%. Again, nothing exceptional. The euro, the euro area is doing 2.2 uh, uh, in comparison. But I mean, still this, uh, uh, so the, the, the economic policy has not affected significantly uh, the performance of the uh, economic uh, of the of the economy in the first ten months of the uh, um, uh, of the Trump administration, as happens also to see in the in this graph. So, and now we come to the tax reform. As I say, the economy is doing fine, um, and it's probably to continue to to do fine in the, in the coming quarters. But uh, um, the administration and the Republicans in Congress cannot claim that uh, uh, this is their merit. I mean, the, the regulation is not enough to argue that, I mean, we are doing this way. So they need really to put something, a stamp that says, this is why uh, the economy is doing fine. They need a narrative also to uh, sell to uh, uh, the US voters in the midterm elections. So there is a very strong incentive for them um, to deliver on that uh, because, I mean, if you say, okay, I did the tax reform, I have a perfect story to tell. So that you say, you see, my, um, sorry. You see, my two last quarters is because people anticipated that I would do tax reform and so they've started to spend and they've started to invest. And what will come after is because I've done tax reform. So it's all my merit. Um, you can say I mean, the, that is not true and so on, but politically it works very well. Uh, uh, the, the, um, and therefore, for, from a 
political economy and political viewpoint to cool. I mean, it's very important that, I mean, the, the Republicans have this time a very strong incentive to avoid the defeat that they had uh, on, uh, on Obamacare. And uh, um, the, um, they want to avoid the mistake of the past, so this time they work much more in a much more organized way. They put together a group uh, that put together the administration, the Senate and the House to work out uh, a, a blueprint for tax reform uh, that would keep everybody together. And from that, uh, they would move uh, with uh, uh, preparing the bills in the House and the Senate. And, uh, uh, and after to go in the final process to, sin uh, to come up with a single uh, uh, legislation, and that is going to happen the probably next week. I mean, they, they, they could even vote next week. If not next week, they will vote the following week. And as I said, having been able to keep almost everybody on board, this time uh, they will deliver. You, uh, I mean, I would say 95% chances that you will have a, a tax reform. Is a good tax reform or a bad, we, we might discuss later, but uh, uh, the chances that will happen are um, very uh, strong. What are the main elements of this reform? So the corporate rate uh, would move, for, for the corporate, uh, the corporate tax rate will move from 35 to 20. You would have 100% expensive of investment. That means that if you do an investment this year, you can deduct completely from uh, the uh, 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 income declaration of the company, 100%. Uh, currently is 50 percent. There is a change in the taxation uh, moving to a territorial system and this in a way for in the tax reform is the most creative and interesting part uh, uh, in order to uh, allow a repatriation of profits that are currently parked elsewhere than in the United States uh, as well as to tax uh, uh, some intangibles that for the time being are not taxed an issue that doesn't exist only for the United States. That we have uh, mutatis mutandis, so a, a, a big discussion in Europe on the taxation of the digital economy and how to avoid tax evasion or uh, tax arbitration that in Europe is particularly relevant. So, I mean, the, the, that part is, is quite interesting, although very technical, although for us, as European creates problem and is where we are quite active because some of these uh, provisions uh, we consider that could be WTO incompatible and we are now lobbying uh, Congress to uh, to change them and to make WTO compatible um, if possible we are while, we are while not taking any position on tax reform is good or bad because it's not up to us it's up to the Americans to decide that but I mean we have to avoid that there are provisions that uh, are incompatible with the WTO rules uh, uh, because that would undermine the multilateral system. Um, but there are also differences. So, for instance, uh, uh, the uh, House bill has only four brackets. Uh, the uh, Senate bill has seven brackets in terms of reduction of the individual rate uh, 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 for uh, uh, personal income. Uh, the highest level of the bracket is 39.6% in the House bill and 35.5% in the, in the Senate bill. Interestingly, means 39.6%, so the top level is the current top level. The big difference is that the current top level kicks in at $500,000 now and would kick in uh, at $1 million uh, 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 with, uh, with the tax reform. That means that uh, for people who gain more than $1 million, they would have a tax cut of $23,000, um, which is uh, a multiple of what will get the people who get only, uh, 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 who, have, uh, who are in the bottom quintile or the bottom two quintiles. Um, the um, corporate uh, uh, rate reduction to 20% uh, would take effect in 2018 in the House, 2019 in the Senate because of a number of rather arcane rules that you have in the presentation, but I will not go through also for interest of time. Um, 
as well as the, um, in the Senate bill and the probably to stay, uh, the elimination of the penalty for people who don't take insurance, uh, which could undermine the uh, market for private personal insurance uh, in the United States and therefore would be a sort of way undermining Obamacare after having failed uh, to do that, that directly, could be done indirectly. Um, so what happens uh, for the next step, as I say, the, the two bills have been approved. So there is one House bill and one Senate bill that have been approved. Now there will be a conference where representatives of the House and the Senate will work together and will come up with one bill that will be voted, as I say, the, uh, next week. And, the, and both the House of Representatives and the Senate have to vote that bill as it is. They cannot change even a comma, but the, if it's past uh, President Trump will sign it to law and therefore it will become fully, I mean, will be implemented starting on the 1st of January 2018 and that would be the first major legislative victory for the Republican Party. Um, so the issue is will it boost growth? Will, uh, 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 will it help economic growth? Here there are various, uh, so I mean the, the, the one, uh, uh, for instance, the, the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors says uh, uh, yes, I mean the growth will increase between 3 and 5 percent over 10 years, uh, cumulative, not every year. Um, it means uh, between 0.3 and 0.5, uh, uh, 0.4 every year has been argued by a number of mainstream Republican economists. Um, uh, uh, conservatives in tank like the Tax Foundation has similar data. Uh, many other think tanks and economists co consider that the impact would be much smaller. For instance, the IMF uh, considered that the impact would be uh, over 10 years. Uh, uh, it's the red line because uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the blue line would be high multiplier. So if you had a stimulus that related to uh, we are uh, much more infrastructure and much less tax cuts. Uh, uh, the impact would be about 1%, but uh, we are uh, the low multiplier, so only uh, tax cut, uh, uh, the, uh, the impact would be quite muted. Um, that is also what I found a number of others in tanks, for instance, the um, uh, the tax policy center uh, or uh, the uh, um, uh, the, the, the pen worked on uh, uh, macroeconometric model. So they have all, let's say, impact on the uh, potential growth that is uh, around 0.1% or less. But the Tax Foundation, as who is believer of the supply side effect of the tax reform, has too. Um, still, I mean, all this, uh, as you can see, falls uh, short, or significantly short of the. Uh, 3% uh, promised by President Trump uh, uh, growth that would have been generated by the tax reform. Uh, even Martin Feinstein gives about 0.2% uh, percentage point increase in potential growth uh, over the decade, uh, so much shorter than the past. That means that that will create a hole in the budget uh, and it means that uh, compared to the baseline, you remember the baseline that we saw before, instead of being a 91% in 2027, the debt on GDP uh, um, would be between uh, are the two red lines that are important, between 97 and 100%. Um, just to give you a comparison, at, at the moment in Europe we are 93, but we are declining. So by 2027, if we continue with the current trends, we'll probably be below 80 or even more. Uh, and this is federal is not uh, the general government deficit uh, that we calculate in Europe. In the case of the United States, the general government deficit is already above 100%. And this means that you probably go by 2027 around 120% of uh, uh, debt on GDP. Um, so will it pass? I said, yeah, I already explained why, um, but the issue is uh, in a way, and they'll come back at the end, uh, whether deficit and debt matter over the medium term and mid long term in the case of the United States. The other thing is the uh, 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 redistributional impact. Um, the 
House and the Senate, as you can see, th they distribute uh, uh, in favor of uh, uh, the top 5% uh, of the population. I will not go through because I know that uh, the discussant will, will look into that. It's interesting that uh, that is the only area where there's been a significant change compared to the unified framework, where the impact that you can see there was much higher in favor of the uh, uh, top income earners compared to the, uh, to the rest of the, uh, uh, of the population. There was strong criticism because of that, and therefore in the two bills, uh, they have tried to mitigate the distributional impact uh, and favor a little bit uh, more the, uh, let's say, central quintiles compared to the top uh, uh, 5%. And I go to the end. Uh, so the, 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 the interesting thing of the new growth model of the Trump administration is that everything is based on a model of investment-led growth. And all the measures that have been taken more or less go either directly or indirectly directly in terms of uh, uh, um, incentives, uh, uh, tax cuts and so on, in favor to profit and profit will generate growth. Growth will enhance productivity because of the technical progress uh, incorporated in new investment that in turn uh, will uh, favor uh, uh, um, high GDP growth. Uh, you go to full employment, that will favor wages, which will also be pushed up by tougher immigration policy. So you increase the uh, uh, bargaining power of the workers because they don't have the competition from foreigners and more aggressive trade policies that uh, uh, reduce the competition on wages from uh, the rest of the world and that in turn uh, favors uh, high GDP growth. So the, um, while in the Obama scheme that you've seen before, the, the administration tried to push on various parts uh, of the economy to support growth, uh, what you have here is that you have a model of investment-led growth and everything is focused on that and that is the key issue. So the, the issue is whether the uh, will Trumponomics produce a permanent high level of investment and I think that, that we could discuss uh, in the... Um, in the Q&A. The interesting thing, I mean, they, they have a point. I mean, the uh, inv investment ratio has declined and has dramatically uh, declined after the Great Recession, has gone up above 20% in 2015. But as again, I checked the last number of the IMF, uh, has moved below 20% again in 2016 and, should, and also in 2017. So you could argue that there is room for having a higher investment ratio and therefore uh, um, policy that uh, uh, push investment could have both the effect of stimulating growth in the short term and increase the growth potential of the economy. We'll discuss after who wins and who loses. So I go to the conclusion because I've taken already uh, too much time. The issue is the upcoming challenges. So whether the um, America first, uh, uh, the domestic dimension were coming back to, the, uh, uh, to my use and therefore the regulation theory and so on, the, the weakening of uh, uh, the uh, um, mode de regulation of the uh, uh, US economy, where a lot that has been done, but that there's a lot of the construction and not too much construction, uh, uh, what can be the effect, how destabilizing can be, uh, uh, whether growing macroeconomic imbalances could create a possible slowdown in 2019 and 2020. And this is important because you remember the, the star that are aligned. If you start to have an economic uh, slowdown, the star will misalign again quite significantly and therefore they could uh, reinforce uh, a, 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 a negative spiral. Uh, growing inequalities uh, increase the widens the fault lines in the US economy. And therefore, uh, while at the moment, I mean, only 10 months is not sufficient to have effects uh, on the US growth regime, 
over the longer term it could have. And on the international part, I mean, the, uh, will the demise of the, of the global liberal order that the US created in the post-war war really will advantage the uh, US economy and the US citizens? And uh, what does it mean in terms of future economic cooperation at global level? institutions like the G7, the G20, the IMF, will we go back to a situation pre-World War II where these things didn't exist or were uh, uh, completely in effect in the political arena like the Society of Nations? And, uh, um, and so remains the question, given what has happened in these months, in these 10 months, what will be the consequences of the Trump uh, Trumponomics uh, for the global economy, but I leave that to the, uh, um, uh, to the discussion and they stop here. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bertoldi, for your very interesting presentation. What we hope to do here in our presentation is to build on it, uh, to summarize some things, but also uh, perhaps provide some fuel for discussion as well um, for the Q&A thereafter. Um, my name is Ryan, this is Aga. Now let's very quickly go through the structure of our comments. Uh, it's broadly in two parts. Aga will be talking about characterizing Trumponomics, um, so there will be a bit of review or summary of what we've just seen, but as I said, we'll push it as well, or try to do so at least. Um, and then in the second part, I'll be looking uh, more specifically at the recently introduced tax reforms, how they will look and the f potential economic consequences um, of, these, of these tax reforms. And then at the end we'll finish with some questions, like I said, to fuel the fire. So I'll just hand it over to Aga now. All right, thank you very much, Ryan. So, as has been told before, there, ha there will be some repetition and overlap with our presentation with Mr. Bertoldi, including this very graph that we are looking at right now. So we'll try our best to avoid any repetition. But uh, as for this graph especially, the two things that we would only like to add is that uh, even at a glance, it, if we are to follow completely with these designations, even at a glance, we can see that most of the points are located on the right, which is conservative. So it's a fairly little bit safe to assume that the, the agenda in general is quite Republican. At least it's not democratic in a way. And also, we, we also want to mention that we are not quite easy with some designation that is being here, like infrastructure spending and government spending, we think that it's a little bit more Republican than how it is portrayed here, and we would like to discuss on that a little bit more later on. But uh, just as to be expected as well, uh, Mr. Trump has published the budget over the summer, and just like to be expected from any Republican budget, it aims for a budget surplus sometimes in the future, which in this case is 2027. And also, however, as is pointed by Keaton by that grab, it also pragmatically borrows from other camp to cater to its populist platform. The most obvious one would perhaps be on trade, of course, which has seen the cancellation and renegotiation of various FTAs. But also, there has been also planned imposition of various sanctions. One of the high-profile one would be the Bombardier airplane that was slapped with 220% tax, which is fairly indiscretionary and only, only applied to that one particular plan itself, which doesn't make any systemic sense. And also, there was also a, a planned imposition of steel sanction as well, which we find to be quite interesting because it was then uh, reacted and replied quite promptly by the international partners, including the European Union in this case, with Mr. Jonko Janker making a prompt reply saying that the European Union has already have their own list of product to be sanctioned from America, which we find to be interesting because there was, there was this one product which is a little bit out of place, but is there, which is a bourbon whiskey. But when we do a little research about that, it turns out that the bourbon whiskey is a main export product from Kentucky, which is the political base of Mitch McConnell, the Republican senator leader. So it's very nicely and surgically designed in a way. However, when in issues like this, in issues like trade, when there, there is a possible divergence between Mr. Trump and the Republican base, it, there, is, there is also signs, however, that it is the Republican base that bends over to Trump rather than the otherwise. Pew Research Center that survey that is published, that is mentioned by Jones as a sample, show that the support of free trade for the Republican actually drops from 56% supporting free trade to 36% after the Trump's election. There is also this polling by the Chicago Council National, which actually also shows the degree of division 
in the Republican Party between those Republicans that support Trump and those that do not really support Trump, like when they are given a statement of NAFTA is, NAFTA is good for the US economy, the Trump Republicans will be less likely to say yes compared with the non-Trump Republican. Also, when they are given a statement that the Trump administration approach to international affairs will do more harm to American workers, the Trump Republicans will be less likely to say yes compared to the non-Trump Republicans. So there really, is a, there really is a sign of division in the Republican Party itself. And to, uh, continuing uh, our discussion before about how we do not really agree with the designation of the infrastructure spending and, and the world spending by Trump as Keynesian, uh, we would like to point out that Trump indeed made an announcement of a one trillion dollar investment plan in, in investment plan in infrastructure. But the thing is that it's not really an our all traditional social Keynesian, so to say, because of this one trillion dollar infrastructure, only two hundred billion dollar will come from the government, and the rest will be filled up by the private sector. And until now, there has been no concrete mechanism laid out about how that's going to really happen. But also, it turns out in the last budget that even though indeed the government will make $200 billion more infrastructure spending, there will also be a stopping of funding for infrastructure that amounts to $255 billion over next year. So actually what comes up is a net deficit of spending in infrastructure, which is amount to $55 billion over 10 years. Not a net spending, but a net cut actually in infrastructure. And also, in the same light, Trump campaign promised an increase, a huge spending, he said, that will transform America, but what the budget uh, unfail is there will be a 3.6 trillion cut over the next decade, and in total around 72 federal agencies would be eliminated. If there is a huge increase in spending indeed, it will be for defense sector, which is $54 billion of increased spending, but uh, that spending will be sourced from uh, the decrease in basically anything that involves with the social welfare of the citizen, like the education and the health and human services, which also include, of course, the $834 billion cut over the next decade in healthcare, which is projected to, to result in leaving 23 million more people without insurance in America. The last point that we, also make to, we would like to make in this part of the presentation is about the carried interest, because the candidate Trump talk a lot about carried interest. He says about how he wants to drain the swamp out of Washington, want to clear the administration from Washington interest. He even labeled Hillary, of course, as the representative of the carried interest. But it seems that the presidential Trump has become the fairy candidate that candidate Trump will not like actually, and we, we can see that actually from we can actually see that uh, at the very least from the two sectors. The first one, of course, is the energy, as has been mentioned. The, there is uh, the whole debacle about the Paris Agreement, the Clean Coal Act, about how Trump want to want to just physically clean the coal <laughs> as if that will work, and then of course there is also this Rick Paris Energy Plan, which efficiency giving subsidy actually for ailing coal power plants this in itself is very uncharacteristic of republican because republican subsidy usually doesn't go along well but this happens and then it leaves us to wonder if this is uh, if this is a flag for our current interest as well because it is known publicly that the contribution, the donation of the oil, gas, and coal sector to republican outweigh that to democrat by 15 to 1 so the there, there is um, some questions to be raised about that. But the biggest one perhaps in us is on the financial sector and regulation. Here we make a grab, uh, a treble comparing the position of campaign Trump, candidate Trump, with Gary Cohn uh, in various issues. Uh, why Gary Cohn, you might ask? Uh, hopefully it will be more, more, more sensible in the, f in the coming minute. But the thing is that we would like to point out that they are very different candidates. The campaign, they are very different person, I mean the candidate Trump and the Gary Cohn. Like in the case of offshore, the candidate Trump raged multiple times against offshoring, saying and even threatening that he gonna have like, he gonna have a 35% attribution tariff for any product that has been benefiting from offshoring, which of course will change the game a lot. But the Gary Cohn, uh, he, he exec uh, Gary Cohn by the way is the president of Women's Side, just to give a context if, uh, if it's not familiar with some of us here. And Gary Cohn executed a massive <coughs> offshoring plan for Goldman Sachs a massive offshoring of the back office function to Bangalore, India, which actually is now the second biggest Goldman Sachs presence in the world after New York City. Uh, the candidate Trump also thought that he will be the greatest job president that God ever created, of course, 
But Gary Cohn, uh, as a president of Goldman Sachs, offers a series of M&A that led to the loss of at least 22,000 jobs. And then the candidate Trump said he described it as disgusting that Pfizer's plan to shift its headquarters overseas to reduce its tax burden. But of course, Gary Cohn executed a very similar deal with one of its clients, Johnson Control. Johnson Control. And perhaps more scandalous than all in our opinion is that in, in one of his very final video advertisement, Trump has the montage of Lloyd Blankfein, which is the CEO of Goldman Sachs, with the narrative saying that they are the, the one that rob our working class, strip our country of wealth, and put money into the pockets of a handful of large corporations and political entities. Shortly, he sort of singled out Goldman Sachs for doing all of those nefarious things. But of course, after the, after the campaign, to follow that logic, Trump then has Gary Cohn on the stage and say, posting in a Trumpian manner, that this is the president of Goldman Sachs, smart. Having him represent us, he went from massive paydays to peanuts. And now Gary Cohn is the director of National Economic Council and the chief economic advisor to President Donald Trump. Of course, a perfect logic. But then he also, he also, appointed, he also appointed four other Goldman Sachs executive to the senior administration post. We do not have anything against Goldman Sachs, but just, we just want to point out that there has been uh, some inconsistencies. There has been some inconsistencies between what candidate Trump want to achieve and what he actually achieved after his election. But nothing wrong with Goldman Sachs in itself. <laughs> so the, the question that can be raised, of course, is then does this affect the plan on financial deregulation? Because the Choice Act, the the, the act that that, uh, that is working on the financial deregulation topic has already passed the House of Representatives on July and it is currently on in discussion on Senate right now and it includes a lot of signific significant provisions that will eventually roll back many of the, many of the things that is already introduced by Dodd-Frank after the crisis. Of course, like Mr. Bertoldi told already, many of this might not eventually pass on but it gives us already an idea of what they want to achieve by if, if we just let them run the game by themselves. The first of all, they want to eviscerate the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau because, of course, there is no need for consumer to be protected in the financial sector. And then there is also uh, the, the move to repeal Falker Rule, which Falker Rule is basically the rule that says that, the, that banks could not trade financial assets using their own money, so they have to have uh, money from the depositor to do that. Also, they are trying to rein back to control back stress tests, maybe even making it happen only every two years or so. They also, they also want to outlaw the special designation and special scrutiny for institutions, financial institutions that are deemed to be relatively more important because after the global financial crisis, we have designations such as systematically important financial institutions and that might be outlawed if this passed through. And then the, uh, the last thing, there is also the rolling back of Dodd Frank's principle the orderly liquidation authority principle. This, we find this particularly to be interesting because what this principle actually do is that when, a when there is a financial institution that is having a problem and is about to bankrupt, then the goal will be to have this institution, according to this principle, to have this institution to liquidate itself in an orderly manner so that it doesn't affect the whole system. And also, the second goal is to make sure that in the next time, after this is all happening, this institution will not be too big to fail anymore. So they will be won, they will, they will be wind down, they will be scaled down. But the, the principle in, indeed acknowledge that to do this, the bank might need some help, financial help, in form of public bailout, but it will only be temporary bailout, and it is legally, legally demanded that they will give the bailout around 10 years after they receive it. So it's there, is in, there will indeed be a bailout, but it is temporary bailout. But under the Choice Act, they, they, they portray this principle as giving a permanent bailout. Even, even the tagline of the Choice Act it itself is saying, growth for everyone, bailout for none. It's, it's, it's portraying this as a blackout, but it doesn't mention that this bailout is actually temporary. But what will happen if we, if we go away, if we erase this orderly liquidation authority and do not introduce a sufficient measure to replicate what it hopes to achieve is that when there is a too big to fail, fail institution having a crisis in the next crisis, and there will be a next crisis, there will be no guide, legal guideline and on, there will be no legal guideline that will push this financial institution to wind down, to scale down and not become a public problem in the next future. And eventually they, will, they, will, they, 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 might, they might just collapse in a disorderly manner and spread to the whole system. 
And of course, one of the big part as well of the Trumponomic, however, is the tax reform. And for that, I will give that to my colleague, Brian. Thank you, Aga. Um, yeah, so as said, I will be focusing on the tax reforms a little bit more. Um, as is sometimes the case for the EPOC seminars, you're never sure if uh, exactly what will be covered. So I'll skip over the first two slides relatively quickly while offering a brief summary, as is encouraged. Uh, in these APOC seminars, so as we have been, as we have heard, we have seen these um, that that, that the, we have two bills: one coming from the House of Representatives, one coming from the Senate, and um, generally now they will be um, they will be uh, sort of merged into one piece of legislation that will be signed off by Trump uh, soon, at some point. Um, broadly, we see income tax, estate tax, and corporation tax are some of the biggest changes. Um, won't go into all the specifics, but uh, we can see that there may be a reduction in the number of income tax brackets, as we, as we heard. Um, there may be small changes in the lowest and highest marginal rate of taxes, but that's um, not so big compared to the, the income, tax, uh, tax, uh, in income tax bracket changes. Um, and there will uh, almost certainly be changes in the uh, standard deduction and personal exemption. Um, but it remains to be seen exactly what the quantity of those changes are. The estate tax, perhaps I will um, just spend a little bit of time on, as I don't think it came up. There will be, uh, almost certainly, because the, uh, the House of Representatives bill and the Senate bill have more or less agreed on this point, there will be a, a raise in the estate tax exemption um, for from 5.6 million to perhaps double that. So this is the amount, uh, the value of the real estates that is inherited by the sons and daughters of um, wealthy individuals will uh, go up quite a bit. And there's even the possibility that it would be repealed in a few years' time if the House of Representatives have their way. The corporation tax is um, something where we can uh, say with a lot more certainty, as we heard. Uh, it almost looks certain that it will go down to 20%. And we see that there's changes in the uh, repatriation um, of taxes that are held uh, overseas by American uh, corporations. Uh, focusing on now on the corporation tax rates, um, as this is where we see perhaps the most certainty, um, I would like to draw our attention to what is a graph that I was actually making for another class, but I thought it was quite relevant here, so I spent a little bit of time on that, which is uh, data from the OECD, where we, ha we have the years 1981 to 2017. And what I've done is just graph the maximum value of the 35 member countries over that period of time, the minimum value at the bottom, obviously, and the average in between. Um, and what we see is this downward trend um, as countries compete um, across the world to try and attract uh, corporate corporations to their countries to create jobs and so on. Um, yes, so what you might not know, and it might be surprising to some, is that uh, the role or the position of the US in this global race to the bottom, we see it here outlined in black, it's actually at the top. Some might think as a force for neoliberalism that they might be closer to the bottom. But uh, 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 yeah, we see US at the top, and with these reforms, we'll see them drop to below the average um, around, so yeah, to 20%. Um, so we've seen very shortly the, the estimated effects of these tax reforms. I'm briefly now going to uh, uh, talk about inequality and the mechanism, the, um, the, yeah, the, the effects on inequality and the effects of inequality then on the more sort of broader macroeconomic picture. We can, I guess, broadly conclude that both of these tax reform bills and the eventual um, legislation will have, if these graphs are to be believed from the Tax Policy Center, um, that they will have a unequal uh, effect on the different quintiles and different uh, parts of the income distribution in the United States. Um, both, both bills looking pretty similar in that sense, but by far, the top one and top 0.1% are looking to get a massive increase in their after-tax incomes. So that's obviously will look to uh, increase income inequality. The second uh, major effect is um, the estimation of these uh, massive increases in government deficits. Um, these seem to be quite, well, massive. And uh, this will have to be paid somehow. And this is something I'll come back to in just a little bit. So the effects. Just to put this in a, in a bit of, um, I guess, context, is to see this as a, a continuation of a trend. 
we see since the 60s, this is data from the Amico database, the European Commission's database, um, we see the uh, functional income distribution, so this is the adjusted wage share, the share of GDP going to, um, going to labor. Um, one minus is obviously the profit share, and we see the decline again in almost linear terms uh, from 1960 to 2016, from around 70% to around 60%. At the same time, and as was mentioned by Mr. Bertoldi, we've seen this uh, growth in personal income distribution. Here we have a slightly different graph where we compare the bottom 50% to the top 1% of income earners in the US, and we see this massive shift where the top 1% actually earn more than the bottom 50%, and that crossover happens somewhere in the mid-90s. So, I come to my last slide before we get to our questions, which is to try and give some sort of analysis um, from what I guess is a post-Keynesian uh, post or more, more Kletzkian um, school of thoughts, which is to try and sum up the potential consequences of these uh, Trump-era tax reforms. So, as Aga mentioned, perhaps there may be the short-term stimulus of this increased spending uh, from the uh, increase uh, after-tax incomes, um, but this is almost certainly going to be short-term if it does occur. And we can also see that this is at the cost of increased public deficits, as we saw. Um, if we think about Kaletsky's profit equation, um, this could then further exacerbate the inequality that is already underway and looks set to continue. Uh, and if not, it would have to be uh, counteracted by uh, reduced government expenditures, which in themselves will also lead to um, a reduction in demand. That is the second point. Generally, we've seen some authors like Pali and um, Dutz and Van Schriek who have um, who've really pushed the point that these growing income inequalities are a significant factor in explaining secular stagnation that we've seen in the Western world in particular, um, as those in the lower parts of the income distribution with the highest marginal propensity to consume are not the ones who are benefiting most from growth. We tend to see a reduction in demand, and we see again with um, Trump and his predecessors, perhaps not so much with Obama, but the supply-side policies are, are not sufficient. We need some demand-side policies as well. Um, and this is especially true in the US, where we have um, multiple studies, like Bowles and Boye, uh, Hein Vogel, and so on, who have all estimated the US to be a wage-led economy, so further exacerbation of the personal income distribution and, uh, well, in this case, the functional income distribution is not helping. Uh, two last points. One is the increased indebtedness, perhaps could, be, will almost certainly be a consequence and perhaps also instability. If we are to look at Stockhammer's contribution to the uh, Cambridge Journal of Economics, um, which coincidentally is one of the most popular articles in the Cambridge Journal of recent years, if not of all time, I, I forget now, but um, a very popular entry um, paper which uh, had as the root cause of the financial crisis growing, in income, uh, growing inequality between labor and capital al alongside and um, kind of interacting with decreased regulation, financial regulation as a cause of the financial crisis. So if we see this um, decrease, in, uh, uh, decrease in regulation or increase in deregulation um, coinciding with more income inequality which um, could lead to increasing debts as the lower parts of the income distribution take on more debts in order to finance their consumption or whatever it, it may be. Um, this could lead to instability. And then the last point is uh, the potential for further political disenfranchisement, more confusion, more rioting perhaps. Uh, who knows what will happen to Trump's uh, supporters, will they stick by him? That actually leads us quite nicely on to our questions that we'll just finish on. Um, so yeah, yeah. Okay, so we will have, we have four questions for Mr. Bertoldi, and I'm going to start with the first one. This one is a little bit philosophical in a sense. Uh, how do we, as an international partner, best deal with Trump? Because there seems to be there are two different philosophical way, philosophically different way. The first one is just to try to bypass Trump and just leave him isolated, like it, like is the case with how some international partners are trying to do so and even local or national partners are doing so in part regarding to the climate change and also the TPPP, the TPP, or is it, it might, might it be better or whether that, it that would even work and might it be better if we just like retaliate head front against Trump. So uh, that would be our first question. The second question, uh, which I just touched on at the end, can we expect to see Trump's political base continue to support him? 
Um, there are some polls that show that less educated and uh, poor sections of society are, uh, um, Trump is very popular with those sections of society. And given these, uh, the, well, the attempted healthcare reforms and the tax and trade reforms that could be seen as hurting the poorest most, will they continue, relatively speaking, relatively speaking, will, uh, will they continue to support him? Third question will be with uh, embedded within the Trump tax reform is of, of course the effort to repatriate corporate profits back to the U.S. Will, on the other hand, there is the, there is also of course the movement to tax the U.S. companies in European level as well uh, from maybe perhaps more strongly than ever from French government itself. And do you would you see that there is a potential conflict happening between the intention of the two economic zone, the, the two economies in the sense that uh, they are, they might be fighting to tax the same the same profit pot, so to say, twice, and then what, what, might, be, what might be the potential remedy if, there is a, if that is seen as a problem? And number four? And the last question we'll just finish on is uh, concerning the global race to the bottom in corporate tax that we've, we've seen in one of the graphs, or two of the, gra uh, two of the graphs. Um, does the EU, I guess this is more inspired by the presentation um, and more regarding the EU, does the EU consider this global race to the bottom uh, in corporate taxes as a particular problem, and if so, what can we do to combat this this tendency? Um, yeah, that's that's our question from our side. We look forward to um, a fruitful debate, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. All right, thank so you very much. the question. Yeah, thank you very much for these wonderful questions, Mr. Bertoldi. The floor is again yours. Uh, I would. Uh, ask you to uh, be brief and maybe uh, yes. <laughs> maybe <laughs> if you can these yes. are very uh, uh, concise and uh, good questions we uh, would like to discuss but maybe 10-15 uh, minutes yeah, such I that we have a lot of uh, space and scope for the audience you got a microphone is that correct I have the microphone yes perfect yes. so the very nice discussion and uh, very good research uh, that went beyond uh, 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 my slides uh, and, the, uh, and also uh, looking at some inconsistencies that uh, required I mean, the, the background work and, and also nice link in the end uh, with the various economic literature on what type of uh, challenges that uh, will be for the future. So the, um, how to deal uh, uh, with Trump, uh, so the, the, the issue is that we remain committed uh, to uh, international economic cooperation and coordination. And I think that there is also misunderstanding sometimes uh, uh, um, where uh, uh, what happens uh, in the rhetoric of President Trump when he goes to uh, um, international meetings, for instance, the recent uh, uh, visit to Asia and, and APEC, uh, um, that is related on the fact that, I mean, the, the uh, and that is not a criticism, but as, let's say, a fact uh, that he has not, as I said before, a previous experience in politics and so on. The, the issue is that after the crisis, uh, uh, the, um, under the impulsion of the US uh, and the European Union recognizes that together the G7 alone was not any longer sufficient uh, uh, to manage the global economy. You had to bring in also emerging market economies and therefore you had the G20. And the G20, uh, the very beginning and the depths of the crisis, uh, work together in a coordinated way that was this uh, uh, coordinated uh, uh, st economic stimulus, both on the monetary and, and, the, uh, and the fiscal side that in fact avoided the repetition of, of the Great Depression. But when the situation normalized uh, in the negotiations, uh, clearly, I mean, all the G20 members are their country first, but still they try to find a common ground and a compromise, and therefore uh, you can still put your interest first, but you can be ready to make some concessions in order to uh, reach uh, something better than the minimum common denominator. And that is the fundamental idea uh, of the G20, and is the fundamental idea of many 
of the international institution and fora that, uh, uh, um, that you have. So the, in that respect is, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, um, the withdrawal from the Paris Agreement and unilateral actions that you have seen also recently, uh, not only in the economic side, but on the political side, uh, seem to reflect still uh, a misconception of how the international relations work. And we, I mean, we hope that there will be also a, a, a learning practice there that uh, uh, can uh, uh, in the future avoid that uh, uh, tensions that are not necessarily uh, materialized because of this uh, uh, sort of misconception. Um, clearly, I mean, the, the, uh, in Paris Agreement, uh, the US uh, isolated and uh, um, we will have to see what are the uh, what is impact on the one hand as i say the the improvement uh, i mean the, the rise in oil prices uh, as well as the diminution cost of uh, um, fracking has made uh, the, uh, the the energy sector in the united states competitive and profitable maybe profitable uh, again on the other hand there is uh, uh, a large market in alternative energy also in the United States that risks to be uh, strongly damaged by uh, the uh, um, uh, this new strength and the changes of the system of incentives and that could favor uh, more Europe and, 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 and many countries of Asia. Uh, the TPP, you can see that uh, uh, the 11 countries without the United States are moving forward uh, uh, to go ahead uh, w without the United States. Uh, in a way, this has also provided new momentum for the free trade agreement between uh, 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 Europe and Japan that has been dragging on for a long time, but because of that, as uh, uh, new momentum uh, is there, and we see that uh, many countries around the world now look to Europe to uh, move towards this new generation of uh, um, uh, uh, trade uh, and economic partnership agreement uh, and so on. The, I mean, the retaliation is something that you want always to avoid, uh, uh, but that is inevitable uh, when the uh, if something that is not compatible to the WTO rules happens. And uh, uh, it's always the last resort. Uh, we want to avoid that. But I mean, if we are slashed with tariffs in the, uh, let's say, in the steel sector, uh, we will have to, uh, um, to do the same. And uh, the way it is, is that uh, you uh, uh, look uh, and the way in which you retaliate on the basis on where the uh, um, politically is uh, more painful for the other side, although cannot be uh, significant. So I mean, I remember that uh, there were the hormones war in the, in the 90s. Uh, so the, uh, I think that uh, Scottish lamb and Italian shoes were hit, not because the uh, uh, the United States had something <laughs> against Scotland or uh, Italy, but they, they knew that this, I mean, the, the, the war was between other countries, and so you try to split the other front, and, and that uh, would be the same in, in the sea. So uh, the things are thought through quite careful in, in a, a political economy type of dynamic in which you try to have the other side to reconsider. Uh, their action. So this is the first. For um, so I mean, we will see in the future how things develop. Uh, we hope that uh, some of the things can be reconsidered, and uh, uh, by the and the, the Trump administration takes um, a more a less economic nationalist agenda and a more multilateral one. But we will have to act uh, on the basis of what will be uh, uh, really implemented. On the political base to continue to support him for the time being, yes. I mean, the, I mean, you've seen the graph before with the trends of the economy, so the necktie and the uh, and the hairs. Uh, uh, it's true that uh, the the popularity of President Trump has been quite pretty low, but if you look at the polls of polls in the last two months, it's flat at 38 percent. 
uh, the, the approval rate. And the disapproval rate is flat at 55. It does not move up or down depending on the tweet of the day or other things. So the, there is a strong uh, <coughs> hardcore basis that was also reflected in the slide that you have shown uh, that uh, um, in a way there is a Trumpization of uh, the Republican Party um, and, uh, the, the and therefore quite strong hardcore people that consider uh, uh, that the criticism against Trump, uh, independently of the specific topic, is sometimes unwarranted because he's there to drain the swamp in Washington. So he's the anti-establishment candidate, therefore the establishment is against him. And being against him, they try to put it in a bad light and therefore let give him the time to drain the swamp and the things will get better. Um, and so you have this uh, uh, stable trend that is also reflected more or less in the support for the Republicans and the Democrats. At the moment, the Democrats have about seven, eight percentage points ahead of, uh, uh, of the Republicans, but there's been a trend that, that has remained quite stable uh, over time. We have to see what happens uh, and what will be the political windfall of the tax reform. Um, and, and I mean, the, the, the health care tax and trade reform and so on. The, the, um, with regard to health care, the things will start to be seen a little bit later than the midterm elections. Uh, on tax, uh, um, I mean, the first effect is that either uh, in 2018 you pay a little bit less taxes, even if you are the lowest quintile, but you pay less taxes, I mean, on average. I mean, the, um, the, the um, where the people that will be mostly it, and there is interesting things there, is the high middle class that live in blue states and the red states because of the elimination of the tax deductions uh, on state and local taxes that you can currently deduct uh, from your income declaration. So the, if, you have, uh, if you have high middle class uh, in uh, New York, California and so on, you probably pay, pay more taxes. And if you are high middle class in Kentucky, Texas, and so on, you'll pay less taxes. So there is a distribution. The interesting thing is uh, one thing that I never expected to come up in the United States. Maybe it's only a blip, maybe something deepest. For the first time, a, a discussion that you have here in Europe on transfer union has come up in the United States. Because the issue is that uh, um, the blue states that I've mentioned are net contributors to the federal government and <coughs> the red states are net debtors, so they receive the money. So they say, well, despite this, you're taxing us more because you, you take the deduction, so the transfer becomes even bigger from blue states to red states. Um, and that is creating some uh, unhappiness, uh, uh, and therefore is a debate that, as I say, didn't exist before, but starts to, to come up. We'll see whether it continues or not, but it will be interesting to see the follow-up. Um, repatriation of corporate profits uh, back to the US present a threat to the, uh, to the EU. Um, not necessarily. I mean, the, um, most of these profits are still are in dollars. I mean, the only thing is that they are parked uh, in uh, uh, fiscal shelters around the world, but it's not that they are, hi they are idle, it's not that uh, they are under the mattress of the people living in the Cayman Island. They uh, continue to be used, but they have as basis uh, the, uh, the Cayman Island or, or other places. So the, the, um, there could be some mismatch in terms of uh, 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 some, uh, um, let's say, foreign companies that have uh, uh, part of these profits in a different currency that they could now be tempted to, to move to the United States. And there could be also some effective uh, repatriation that could create some uh, uh, strain to uh, some European banks that have, I mean, that hold this uh, uh, profit. I mean, the, there was the case uh, uh, 
uh, the reference is the reform of uh, the tax cut in 2003, uh, introduced by Bush at the time, uh, that were smaller. Uh, there was some uh, short-term strain in a couple of European banks, but went away quite rapidly. And of course, I mean, if the ECB is there to, to provide all the liquidity necessary. So, I mean, I, the, the there could be here and there some, but it's more localized than systemic. Um, and it's probably to be short-term. Um, but it's something that we are looking to that because, I mean, they say the, the size this time is bigger, so it could be that there is some nonlinearities there. Um, so the, the global race to the bottom, the, the, there is one thing that I should have probably stressed a little bit more in the thing. I mean, the, the, uh, there are various drawbacks in the way in which the tax reform has been pushed. Uh, um, the, the, uh, and the speed uh, and so some of the uh, norms are quite debatable, but the general idea has been that uh, um, what they want to do uh, is to reduce the rate and broaden the basis. Uh, because the figures that you've shown shows the statutory rate uh, that uh, companies are supposed to uh, pay uh, to uh, the US federal government. But if you look at the effective, the U.S. is currently at 22. Um, so the idea in itself is to simplify. So I mean, we reduce the rates and we broaden the base, so we eliminate the distortion. So I mean, there are companies that, uh, for some reason, pay 15, or even those that are able to go through tax shelters and so on, pay single digit uh, or, or close to nothing. And there are ones that are not able to find uh, their way through the complex US uh, tax system and pay 35. So the idea in itself is, uh, uh, um, is not wrong. And uh, so the, the if they were able to, let's say, uh, to move to 20 or 21, there are discussions that they, in fact they could move to 22. Uh, as a statutory, that would mean probably effective something around 20 uh, because of the elimination of a number of deductions. Then, I mean, the why not? I mean, there the, the, the are good economic arguments uh, uh, to do that. The, um, and doesn't necessarily represent a, a race to the bottom. Um, the issue where, uh, as European Union, um, we are pushing both in the G20 and uh, will, there will be a big push. Uh, there is already, but will become even stronger next year, is the issue of uh, the taxation of the digital economy, where uh, the digital companies, I mean, pay very, very low effective uh, 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 tax rate. And uh, uh, there is a need to create uh, a level playing field. And on that, uh, the European Union is pretty determined now. Both, most of the, not all, but most of the uh, member states, in particular big ones, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, and the European commissions uh, are determined to uh, move forward and to try to, um, to tackle the issue in, uh, um, uh, in a way. And that, in a way, a voice uh, the, the would be probably more effective uh, the, uh, uh, the, the global um, let's say, uh, in tackling the global ra uh, race to the bottom that simply uh, um, looking at the statutory uh, um, uh, uh, corporate rate, in particular if together with statutory you have so many uh, um, uh, deductions, possibility, uh, and so on, that uh, creates a very uneven field uh, depending on which sector and which company you are operating with. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I hope that became clear more or less. If not, uh, we can get back to it. Um, so in order to have a bit of a lively discussion, uh, I think it's best if you have uh, nothing against it that we co always collect around three questions and then uh, yeah. give the floor back to you so 
Perfect. Perfect. Uh, very important, state your name and your option first and formulate brief and clear questions, please. And I would, uh, to begin with, ask for questions of clarification. Was there any concept, any terms, any slide you would want to see again? Um, is there anything about it? Tiago, maybe? Okay, then we go straight to uh, contents and further questions or questions based on uh, these proposed already by our colleagues. Um, I, I start with the students, is that okay? Okay, so. So, my name is Thiago from Upton B. Thanks a lot for the presentation. <coughs> I have three quick questions that uh, raise in my my mind during the presentation. First one was on the uh, Obama outcomes. You pointed out four things, which was slow growth, uh, steady decline in unemployment, wage stagnation, uh, losses for skilled labor. One pos positive, which was the strong stock market. I would like to know, so because this looks like really pretty bad, and I would like to know a quick view on what do you think about the Obama. Uh, times and the other question you pointed out that Hillary Clinton had a strong redistribution economic program and I don't remember uh, that appearing a lot actually it looked like more uh, really mainstream uh, program and the last one was on the investment led growth uh, I would I would you point I, I didn't understand is if it's uh, their proposal, or if you think it, it actually will lead to an investment-led growth, uh, because of the the characteristics that you pointed out, as like corporate taxes, deregulation, and government inv investment, which in their presentation uh, is not clear if they actually are going to do that, uh, doesn't sound for me that actually really leads to investment. Thank you. If I'm counting correctly, these were already three questions. Yeah. <laughs> but um, would you take one someone more, else? Yes. We take one more. Yeah. Or two more. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Eric. I'm from Option A, uh, and you mentioned that the Trumponomics has this uh, certain focus towards an investment-led growth, or at least that's what they hope to be. Um, would you know if there's um, any accounting made for uh, investment intensities that vary across industries? Or is this approach just in general for, for the entirety of the economy? That's mm -hmm. it, thank you. So Obama outcomes, uh, uh, strong stock market. As I say, the, I don't know if I'm able to go back to my, should be there the, Let's see. Yeah. So the the um, what Obama wanted, uh, uh, I mean, the uh, Obama administration was trying to support. Oh yes. Sorry. Just, just, just full ah, full screen. Well then. So here, so the the, um, the idea of the Obama was uh, the, the Obama administration was to strengthen demand in order to uh, uh, support investment. So you have an accelerator model, um, and the investment would have uh, after the collapse in 2009 brought stronger productivity together to the fact that it was also incentivating. Uh, the uh, high-tech sector and the economy that were expected to have uh, higher productivity gains than uh, the more traditional sectors and so on. This has not happened uh, because, I mean, the, the, the interactions were complex uh, the, and uh, many of the measures were not easy to implement given the fact that uh, uh, the, uh, in 2010 uh, he lost the majority in Congress, sometimes in the House, sometimes in the Senate, sometimes in both. Um, 
So the, the, uh, the outcomes were uh, not great in the sense that uh, um, despite that unemployment continued to decline steadily, uh, people were not happy on the jobs that they found and the uh, wages stagnated uh, uh, significantly. And they had the problems of very long stagnation of productivity growth. And the point came up on whether, I mean, the US was entering a phase of uh, secular stagnation. Um, I think that the issue of secular stagnation for the United States is at the moment probably weakened on the fact that the Fed is normalizing interest rates and uh, the economy is starting to perform stronger. The thing is to see is whether wages and productivity will go up. That is the remains the, uh, uh, the big question mark. But overall, I mean, if you think at uh, how, I mean, we, we don't have an example of an economy, uh, of an economy, the global economy getting out of uh, uh, a great depression because the only example that he had before, the 1933, was the collapse and uh, uh, long periods of uh, quite strong volatility in uh, uh, economic activity plus uh, a uh, spiral of protectionism that uh, made the example uh, not comparable. I mean, the, the, uh, my preliminary conclusion for the uh, outcomes of the uh, Obama administration is that the, he did a lot of things that went in the right direction of creating a more coherent uh, uh, economic system that uh, would have brought probably more benefits if the actions uh, uh, would have continued over time. The issue of the um, stock market is in part related to, and there's been a discussion on that, on the unconventional monetary policy of, uh, of the central banks that uh, um, by intervening and uh, um, buying uh, um, various financial products, including equities and so on, boosted the, uh, um, uh, uh, the equity values and in a way also contributed to the increase of, of inequalities. Uh, but if the alternative was to remain trapped uh, in a even lower economic growth, uh, we're uh, um, uh, a much sluggish economy, uh, then I think that I still consider that the, 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 the central banks uh, around the world did the right things, even if that had a collateral effect of having a temporary uh, raise in inequalities, uh, um, because in the end there was uh, raising inequalities, but in a situation where the economy was growing and uh, you prefer that to a situation where inequalities uh, stagnate or go down, but the economies go down in parallel. Um, on the um, um, well, it's true that I mean the the the, the um, Hillary's program was for certain. I mean the the uh, and the thinking was mainstream uh, economic thinking. On the other end, as I say, the, the if you look at the her program was a program of redistribution. She didn't have uh, uh, much in terms of uh, 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 boosting further economic growth. I mean, one of the things that was missing, for instance, was that even Obama had in his proposal a, re a reform of the corporate uh, tax system and a reduction of the corporate rate from 35 to 28. Hillary didn't have in the, in the thing. There was not much apart from investment infrastructure that would have uh, uh, boosted growth. Um, but there was a lot of uh, having the top income earner paying for additional welfare programs, uh, uh, both for children, retraining, and so on. The problem was that these <coughs> things proved not to be so popular among the voters. Um, 
uh, with regard to the investment-led growth. I mean, uh, the criticism is right. I mean, they didn't say uh, it was a little bit short of time whether it would work or not. I mean, it was in the, in the list of questions that I had uh, uh, at the end was will it work uh, and uh, um, what will be the um, uh, and uh, whether this is uh, one of the uh, of the major challenges? I mean, the, there are two issues. So, the, the um, is the level of investment that you have at the moment the uh, um, a level of investment that you cons could consider a stable? Uh, over time, um, because there were excesses in the past, um, because in part of the uh, um, of the crisis of 2009-2010 was driven by uh, not only subprime but also uh, a situation where investment uh, was uh, 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 allocated to the wrong sectors, and therefore there was an, uh, an, an excessive level of it or whether there is room for having a higher level of investment uh, given the fact that uh, uh, part of the collapse in productivity growth is related to the fact that investment was so weak uh, uh, in the last decade and therefore the, the uh, will it work in that way um, that is all the question. I mean, the, the, um, the Trump administration, but also Republican in Congress, are convinced that all this has to come from the private sector. Um, the question is that why are doing that, and was quite well presented by the discussant, that they are cutting on a number of uh, other programs that are related to uh, research and development uh, uh, spending. Um, and uh, honestly, I mean, I never believed that infrastructure was uh, a real priority for the Trump administration. I mean, the, um, I remember very clearly how the issue of uh, one trillion dollar infrastructure came. I mean, the, at the end of uh, uh, July, uh, Hillary Clinton had presented a program with 500 billion dollars uh, additional infrastructure in uh, I think 250 on new government spending, 250 uh, the creation of a sort of European investment bank for the infrastructure in the United States. A journalist, uh, one week later, uh, there was nothing in the Trump program at the moment. And journalists asked President Trump, uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, 500 billion, what do you will do for infrastructure? And they say, one trillion. <laughs> um, and after that, uh, Navarro and Ross, that was mentioned there uh, in September, put forward a paper saying, well, it's 100 trillion because we will leverage uh, private investment. We will provide 175 billion uh, uh, dollars of tax credit uh, that uh, will incentivize companies to spend up to 1 trillion, um, which, by the way, rule of thumbs rule is what we have in the Juncker investment plan, although I mean it's structured in a very different way and I mean and has been possible to realize because uh, I mean in our case in European case has worked. I have much more doubt that it would work uh, uh, in the case of the United States because our is not tax credit and so you can argue that it's not certain that uh, would produce the same thing and in any case there would be also a mismatch in infrastructure because I mean if you have to fix a hole in a road you don't do public par uh, private partnership because you don't put uh, a toll uh, in 20 meters of road say well that uh, you have to pay for so I mean the, the um, the issue is whether investment, private investment alone can uh, uh, produce this boost in productivity that uh, would uh, in turn uh, uh, in, uh, strengthen the, 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 uh, uh, the, the potential growth of the US economy and so on, or whether you need, uh, let's say, a more uh, coherent uh, and uh, multi-pronged aspect where the, the, the various issues interact uh, uh, in a different way. I mean, the Republicans are convinced that that will work. I have uh, uh, more doubts, um, but that is the issue on which uh, substantially uh, we will see over the medium term whether the, the, the uh, substantially 
their America first uh, type of economic model is viable or rather um, there will be blockages uh, in the uh, in the investment led growth that will not translate uh, as much as in productivity and higher growth uh, and they expect and they will have it was mentioned by the uh, discussant uh, a pullback a pushback from the increase in the imbalances uh, higher debt uh, 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 higher social tensions uh, uh, because of uh, some distributional effects that are related to the various measures that they have taken in the, in the program. Um, and that answers a little bit also the, the uh, on investment intensity in the, in the different sectors. You could say that in, in, I mean in the case of uh, the uh, tax reform is really across the board. And the idea is rather that uh, the EU had uh, with the various deductions in different sectors uh, in the past that uh, uh, that was distortive, but that, uh, the idea is rather to uh, go across the board to benefit higher investment uh, um, uh, in the way. The but that has to be nuanced because, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, on the deregulation side, there is a significant change in incentives uh, in a number of industries, in particular in the one related to climate change uh, and the green economy. And there you would see much stronger uh, impact on investment intensity. Uh, you can expect that energy will go up and in other industries will go uh, in wind industry, for instance, will go down. Okay, that was clear to you. Good, we continue with the next round. Hello, uh, I'm Afroz Elom, I'm from uh, Group C. So my question is about like how you see the challenges uh, that other economy is uh, 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 facing based on this uh, Trump administrator, especially if you look at G20 and others, and especially some of the decision that US take, it's really kind of go against like what other uh, 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 big economics is taking, for example, the environment issue or this uh, climate change. And I have another question uh, regarding this, uh, uh, like uh, uh, recent uh, tax uh, reforms for the education in US. Like there is a kind of uh, a huge discussion among the students, like uh, the, edu uh, the tax they increase for the uh, uh, graduate students, how it will have effect, especially if you can say more about it's this tax on the debt market with this student. So that's my question. Yeah. Um, hello, my name is uh, Maria Matalam. I'm from Option C. And uh, thank you for your discussion today. Um, I think we had a very good discussion of the internal politics and political economy of the US. Uh, perhaps I would like to hear also uh, a little bit about your intake um, about the external politics of the U.S., especially whether you think uh, the scene seems is, is just being spontaneously uh, chaotic or is it, uh, I mean, especially with regards to the Middle East situation and uh, the immigrants. Um, and yeah, whether that was uh, pre-intended and pre-planned or just came <laughs> on the spot. Thank you. Leave it a female uh, round for now, Luisa. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I would just like to ask you uh, if you could please go deeper uh, on how will the tax cut uh, be compensated uh, by either increasing revenues or uh, decreasing expenses? And if there is any intention of complementing um, this kind of uh, this approach uh, with uh, redistributive policies. Yeah. So the um, on the international, uh, um, we will have to see. Uh, for the time being, the uh, for instance, the G20 is not undermined. Mean meetings are going on and so on. I mean, the, the, there is uh, maybe a push by the US to streamline uh, and to have less commitment and looking more 
at issues like uh, global imbalances uh, um, because I mean of the trade uh, 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 issues that they have uh, and it's pretty interesting how the, 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 the focus of the current administration has shifted from the current account imbalance to the trade imbalance. Uh, um, that is related a little bit to this uh, idea of nationalistic uh, economic policy and the fact that there should be a sort of balancing uh, uh, at bilateral level rather than looking at the picture at uh, uh, the global level. Um, the, the, um, as I say, the, the, the global economy for the time being is doing well for many of the reasons that I say the stars have aligned, the stars have aligned also international level, the countries that were in deep recession uh, last year like Brazil and Russia uh, have come out of recession. You probably have no big country left with negative growth this year. Uh, the global economy uh, uh, is moving uh, smoothly forward and uh, um, you have imbalances accumulating. There is concern about the high leverage in China, uh, uh, of in particular the corporate sector. Um, you have concern that uh, the uh, trade tensions could escalate pretty rapidly. You have all the concerns that are geopolitical, but they could rapidly spill over on the economy. So the the. Um, it is a little bit a period of wait and see. Um, as I said, not much as uh, despite the that a lot is boiling uh, below the surface uh, on trade policy, nothing has really happened so far. Uh, there is there has not been any indication that uh, the US would plan a major withdrawal from international institutions. Uh, uh, the, uh, um, there is no undermining of the IMF and the World Bank. So as I say, the, we are sort of in a, an easy situation um, and uh, we will have to see what happens in the coming months. Um, with regard to students, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, this is something uh, interesting that is going on that, I mean, the, the uh, m less students are now going to the US. Uh, is benefiting uh, uh, Canada and Australia in premise, but uh, it's also started to benefit uh, more in general Europe at large and other places. Um, it seems to be, let's say, the, um, uh, a strange move because, I mean, the, the Everybody recognizes the value added of the students that go to the United States and that after they're incorporated and that uh, provide that they've been source of dynamism for the economy also because there is a big gap between, let's say, higher education and uh, the level of the people who instead have uh, only a uh, high school degree or lower. Uh, where their productivity is much lower than, uh, for instance, in Europe. I mean, the, ISO, I mean the, the system of apprenticeship that you have in Europe is much stronger than what you have uh, in, in the United States. So, I mean, the, the in a way, by undercutting the contribution that the students will give to the U.S. economy, they are undercutting one of the sources uh, of growth and I mean and, and it's pretty relevant. I mean I was last week in Chicago speaking uh, in a dinner with uh, people who were uh, at the Chicago Booth School and they were saying I mean we, we are seeing a really dramatic decrease in people coming to the United States and that, uh, and that, and that is a problem um, for uh, uh, over the medium term for the US economy. Um, External policy of the US, I mean, the, whether there is a method or, or it is, uh, uh, let's say, something driven by what's going on here and there. The, I mean, it the, the doesn't seem that there is uh, a fully thought through and coherent global policy of the United States. I mean, it seems that uh, the policy of the United States is focused on 
some hot spot that can be North Korea, can be the Middle East, uh, and so on. Also reflected by the fact that the State Department at the moment is understaffed and uh, quite weakened. I mean, the, the, the major concern that raises for us, if you look at Iran, you can look also at recent developments uh, uh, in Jerusalem, is that uh, um, there is not enough consideration of uh, the fact that uh, um, by taking measures uh, that uh, um, uh, let's say are not in continuity to a policy that has been pursued over time, uh, calls into question uh, the commitments of other countries. So, I mean, if you have pursued a certain policy until a certain moment, uh, take the case of Iran, and you say, okay, I mean, the, the um, Iran is still complying with the, uh, uh, the agreements that is signed, but uh, we decided that nevertheless, we, we state that doesn't complain, uh, uh, um, sorry, doesn't comply. Doesn't comply. Um, that means that in future, other countries that uh, might be interested to, or might be pushed towards deal uh, of this type, uh, will see mostly drawbacks. I mean, what is the advantage uh, of signing this type of things that are proved? pretty effective in terms of the outcome that you want to reach if uh, unilaterally somebody after decides that uh, despite the compliance, you're not complying. Um, and that is uh, uh, a major problem that risks to destabilize uh, uh, very fragile equilibrium that you see in various parts of the world. And, and that is something that uh, I think that should have been uh, considered more carefully before uh, uh, the move, and that has been also what, I mean, the, the, the message that you've seen recently for the case, of, for instance, of Jerusalem, that uh, uh, the uh, European Union and the leaders of the European Union have sent. But, I mean, for Iran, the, clase, the case, uh, for some aspect, uh, 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 also strong, um, although, I mean, the, the you can still have the Congress to decide not to push forward despite the, the US president decide not to comply to that. But I mean, the, uh, there is a list of consistency that uh, has created some problems, uh, at least in some of the issues that, uh, uh, that, that we have seen. Um, how a tax cut will be compensated? I mean, that is uh, uh, something that we don't know yet. I mean, we know that the Republican in Congress uh, might want to uh, work on the reform of the entitlements, uh, so Social Security, uh, health insurance, Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, will they, um, uh, in order to reduce the size of the welfare state, because I mean, they, they consider that it's provide the wrong incentives to the economy. Will that be the case or will be others, I mean, uh, other policy? In the case, and that was interesting, in particular the electoral campaign, um, the appeal that Donald Trump had uh, compared to Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton was saying, I mean, the, um, we have a problem of uh, debt and deficit uh, and uh, also of financing the programs. Uh, and therefore should be done through internal redistribution, through domestic redistribution. The idea of Trump was uh, less, since we had so bad trade deals in the last 25, 30 years, will be the rest of the world that will pay for that. But as he has realized, it's much more difficult. So we will have to see whether the alternative is to have more debt because in a way, I um, mean, the US has always a lender of last resort. And in any case, if there is a problem with the US debt, it's not only a US problem, it's a problem for the world. Or instead, whether the, uh, there will be other policies, but that the other policies, as long as uh, 
an, an, a Republican administration would mean um, less uh, 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 social welfare programs, more targeted uh, and more uni uh, less universal than uh, you have now. Okay, looking at the time, I'd maybe propose a big uh, last round, starting from Lila, going to Clara, uh, <coughs> Emmanuel, Victoria, and then to the professor in the first row. And the other. <laughs> in the, okay. Hello, I'm Leila from Argentina, from Option C. Uh, I would like to ask you about, the, you were talking a little bit about this uh, investment-led uh, regime Trump is proposing and how uh, we see that during the last decades we have seen the deterioration of the investment profit uh, nexus where less and less uh, profit is going to investment. And you also mentioned a little bit about how uh, Trump, for the first time, maybe in the, the history of the U.S., is uh, reducing uh, sharply the investment going to R&D and innovation. So uh, in which way do you see this as a, as a threat to the leading position of the U.S. Uh, as, a, as a world power in terms of industrial innovation? And secondly, coming from Latin America, we uh, saw uh, with big interest this uh, shift for more protectionism. But as you said, also we see the, the European Union uh, starting to build more and more links with uh, Latin America and, and we are a bit afraid of how this could lead to an unequal relation and not a win-win uh, position. So if you could tell us a little bit about that strategy and how it's unfolding. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I'm Clara from Canada, option C. Um, my question is about animal spirit. So we are seeing in, your fra in, the, in the framework just behind you that profit would lead to investment-led growth type of thing. But I'm questioning the type of link. Is that the direct link? But we actually need to talk about um, the animal spirit and how uh, investor actually wants to, to be proactive in the economy and invest. Um, not assume that profit would lead to that. And so we need to understand um, maybe the kind of impact that uh, Trump is posing into the economy in terms of creating trust in, in how investment could be interesting. Um, and that for me was interesting because I'm personally working on coal miners in Appalachia uh, mm -hmm. that you mentioned. Um, and people there are not actually pushing for investment, even the people in the coal industry. Um, so I'm wondering maybe as you are in, in the US and as you understand this situation quite well, um, well how could you perceive these, uh, these uh, investments and how, um, how people are actually, like how the private sector actually uh, tend to, uh, to do these investments? Um, yes, thank you, Professor. My name is uh, Emmanuel. I'm from Option A. I'm from uh, Option A. I wanted to ask about the effect of the uh, sentimental psychological thoughts of Trump and Trump voter on his on the content and the direction of uh, Trump uh, economics. Uh, f for example, after the election, uh, numerous surveys were done on the reason why Trump uh, won, and m many of his uh, voters don't even know about uh, Obama's care. They don't even know that they are benefiting from the care. It was when they are about to lose the uh, Obama care, they knew. So I wanted to ask about this uh, sentimental thought uh, about the policymaker and the citizens, the effect on the content on the, on the direction of, of his uh, economics. Brief. Very brief. Uh, my name is Victoria from Option B. I have a really quick question. Um, with Trump, effectively ruining or at least very strongly damaging the reputation of the US as a reliable partner. Do you see the um, US dollar losing its role as world money any time in the foreseeable future? Thank you. Okay, that's it for the students part and I would, if possible, pass it to the gentleman here in front. Thank you. No, Guillaume Duval, moi je suis, I'm a journalist in, uh, by Alternative Economic in France. Uh, I have a lot of hope in uh, Trump presidency. 
re in um, respect to the uh, European policy, that he will be able to oblige Europe to change his economic policy and to reduce his external surplus and to force Germany to change his uh, economic policy, what uh, European countries didn't succeed to do. Uh, it didn't happen till now. Uh, have we a chance that it happens in the future? And uh, the second question was, uh, you mentioned it, but uh, is that a risk for the unity and the existence of the United States in the future? As is a caliphate anything thinkable or not due to the divergences between red and blue states and so on? Okay, my name is Fred Coleman, I'm a visitor. We talked about fiscal policy, talked about the tax package being a fiscal stimulus. What about the other half? What about monetary policy? Federal Reserve is going to increase interest rates several times next year. Lots of economists think these two are in conflict. How do you see that conflict playing out for U.S. outlook next year? Thanks. Lots of questions, not much of time. So, <laughs> um, the, um, so the issue is uh, for um, investment and growth and uh, uh, research and development, uh, whether, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a reduction in the uh, uh, research, in particular the basic research, uh, could have negative impact. Uh, that is a possibility. Uh, the counter argument that is used is, but if we are able to boost investment, the technical progress related to that will probably compensate and goes to the question that I had. So if private investment alone able to uh, lift productivity uh, as the other things. I mean, the, as I say, personally I have some uh, uh, um, uh, uh, question mark on that. Uh, um, I'm not convinced that that, that that would work. It's true that in certain areas, in particular defense, I don't expect any significant change in the uh, in, in research and development, but we know also that uh, the basic research development in the military has uh, uh, spillovers that are probably smaller than in other part uh, of the um, of research and development. So uh, the issue is whether the, uh, the US uh, will uh, lose its leadership. I mean, doesn't seem to be in the cards for the time being. That doesn't, I mean, impede that uh, other countries might try to follow different ways and maybe uh, they can go, uh, they can get closer to the frontier uh, where uh, on many areas the US are, you know, other areas also Europe uh, competes uh, um, as well as, uh, as the United States, um, and not only Europe. Um, the, um, the deal we're, uh, between the European Union and, for instance, Latin America, there are a number of discussions. The, I mean, the, the, I've not followed it closely. Um, one thing that when I was following the G20 and the countries of the G20, so I had the opportunity to vote both to Argentina and Brazil, uh, seems to me that uh, the first major weakness in the negotiations uh, is due to the fact that the Mercosur countries have very, very big difficulties to find a unified position to deal with. Uh, uh, with we, we are the European Union and therefore the things move uh, very slowly um, and so on. So indeed, the, my advice would be that the Mercosur countries should uh, 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 do more integration first. Uh, um, but this doesn't, I think that, I mean, in, 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 uh, in the way of countering the, um, uh, the trend to uh, more economic nationalism and so on is however positive that uh, we have the discussion and we try to, uh, to move forward even if it takes time. Um, on uh, um, animal spirits uh, and uh, creating uh, trust and investment, um, I mean, the, the, 
there are two things. I mean, the short term, I mean, the, uh, uh, again, the alignment of the various factors is creating also demand. So, I mean, you have not only the profit uh, led that, in fact, for during many years, I mean, the, the, the companies had the very good, very elevated profits, uh, but they didn't invest. And uh, there was also a sort of first mover stigma. Companies in 2012, 2013 that had very good investment announced, rather uh, big investment plan were pretty uh, uh, badly punished by markets. Um, and therefore, everybody took a cautious uh, uh, stance. I mean, you could say that in this situation where there is uh, uh, some strength in the demand, uh, where wages start to creep up, although very slowly, and the other thing that has not been noticed is that the saving ratio of households has gone down, so there is more consumption, you have also an accelerator effect. And that, as I said, in the short term could uh, um, help the, uh, 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 the US economy and, uh, uh, and therefore that uh, could also push investment uh, uh, higher. Whether that is sustainable over the medium term is, uh, is much more questionable. So, I mean, the, personally, I'm, I think that 2018, uh, the, uh, uh, it will be uh, relatively strong growth, not 3%, but let's say in the range of 2.5 to 3. Uh, but you have increasing risk for 2019 and, uh, and 2020. And in fact, some uh, um, uh, forecasters in the private sector have the US economy moving even below 2% uh, growth, that, uh, um, which doesn't exclude also if and comes a little bit to the monetary policy issue, uh, uh, the tightening of monetary policy uh, uh, goes faster than expected. I mean, the interesting thing is that uh, markets still anticipate one hike uh, from now to the end of 2018. All the private sector economists that I've spoke to have four hikes. Um, so there is a mismatch between uh, uh, markets and what the Fed will do. Um, and uh, probably an adjustment uh, in the stock market is, is in the card. Always difficult to predict uh, when it happens. Uh, if I knew, I would not be here, but uh, in New York. Uh, um, the, the, um, but that is the, uh, um, uh, is the thing. So there is uh, monetary policy. The, the choice that has been made by the president in terms of uh, Fed members are pretty uh, mainstream. Uh, so you could argue that uh, they, so the mainstream economists are coming back through the Fed more than through the administration. Um, um, we will see, I mean, Powell has always wanted to do monetary policy with Janet Yellen. So the, the um, that is something that uh, uh, we'll see. But I mean, the, the if uh, wages should start to rise faster, financial condition could become tighter very rapidly. And again, the alignment of star could uh, misalign uh, pretty rapidly. And that is a downside risk for uh, the economy. Is the um, um, Trump undermining the role of the dollar? Um, I don't think so. As long as the Fed continues to be a very strong and credible institution, the role of the dollar will remain. And there is no uh, real substitute uh, uh, um, uh, to that. And I mean, uh, um, in the current situation, I mean, while in the future, who knows? But in the short term, I, uh, I don't think that it's also in the interest of the euro to think to uh, uh, substitute the dollar. The things will evolve over time. And uh, as the ECB says, we don't promote, not, neither promote nor hinder the internationalization of the euro. Um, the um, European policies, whether the um, Trump will uh, determine a change in economic policy and reduce the external surplus. I mean, there, 
there's been a push and there will be some effects. For instance, uh, there is a commitment to uh, increase the uh, defense spending. Um, I think that uh, um, that is providing, I mean, I see areas uh, uh, that are related to uh, the speech of President Macron at the Sorbonne, but also the things that are developing at European level. Um, I mean, the, the uh, President Trump might get some of what he's asking for, so the 2% uh, expenditure in defense, but uh, um, I also get something that was not entirely in his plan. So in, in the past, what we had was that we didn't spend much in defense, but we bought almost the entire hardware uh, from the United States. Now there is the reflection to have uh, a more strategic thinking that doesn't mean that we will not buy uh, the thing, but that also to develop uh, a more integrated European defense industry. And so part of the increase might well uh, uh, um, determine, uh, uh, might well remain in Europe, but in any case will strengthen uh, domestic demand and so on. But I think that in any case, uh, um, the, the, uh, it will not be neither the, let's say, stronger pressure uh, in terms of defense spending or uh, uh, the um, Obama administration trying to win the intellectual argument uh, with Germany on the fact that uh, they had to have more domestic demand and reduce the surplus that will change uh, the thing. I think that the, the, um, if there will be some change uh, will be on the basis of uh, a grand bargain that could happen inside the European Union there is discussion, but as we know, there is a lot of uh, political certainty at the moment. And we have to see how the, this fog of political uncertainty disappears to uh, see whether that will be the case or whether we will continue to have uh, um, very counter surplus. The, and this is my last remark and comes back a little bit to my experience when I was in Asia with the Asian financial crisis. I mean, we, we have had a sort of development that is similar to what happens in the Asian financial crisis, uh, uh, after the Asian financial crisis, where the country who had surplus kept their surplus, the countries that were deficit uh, went into surplus because they learned that if you have a deficit, you could be badly punished when the things go wrong. But that, uh, on aggregate terms, the term is a suboptimal policy where you have uh, insufficient investment and uh, in the end you need a, 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 a consumer of last resort. And you don't want to go back to the type of global imbalances that we have seen before the uh, crisis of 2008-2009. And that was my last remark. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, Moreno. I just wanted to make a, a question and comments. Uh, one of the surprising things in what you presented is that uh, due to what you call the alignment of stars, there has been some uh, success and stabilization of the support base, despite the strong contradiction between the promise and what is done between the shift between from General Motors to from GM to GS, Goldman Sachs. It seems that GS has a great role in this alignment of start in a speculative world. But I much appreciate all question on uh, what really will be this investment led project. It seems to me very explosive in a way. It's not the GAFA. The GAFA will like globalization. It's not the defense industry, because they need public money. So it goes around. And as for some other industry, it's very dubious that, because in first place, effectively, to adapt with the new norms, they have to follow. But this will not be backed by the government. And a point you didn't mention is the fact that private indebtment has raised to relatively high level on cars, on education, and all that, which will be cut, so it will there will still be a demand. It's rather explosive situation. 
when you take the countries where he had big supports, CCP and uh, there is a, 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 a probability of explosion, a rioting and all that, which is tremendous. I mean, what you, when, when Trump won the election, a lot of these people took it as a revenge against Obama, even racial issue. And it seems that if, if this investment plan increases the tension in all these places, it may be explosive. Internally explosive, and I want to, which means that it has stabilized, but not for that long. It's very short, term, even before you go back to the US. And then on top of that, we have the external situation. North Korea, Iran, Palestine, and then any others. I guess you will find something conflictual also in Latin America and in Africa, where we are going to have a big, big demographic boom also creating tension for the time being is not involved. So my question will be on uh, internally and externally. Don't you think it's very explosive for the previous reasons? Um, very rapidly, I think that uh, uh, there is the fault lines, as you say, that are widening. I mean, as I said, the, I said it in different ways. Saving ratio is going down, therefore the indebtedness is going up in the, the uh, in, in the thing, but is also in the short term creating demand and therefore pushing the thing. The, the, um, my impression, so I, I'm not too worried uh, because I go back next week uh, that there will be something <laughs> in such a short term. The, the issue is, as, as I was saying, coming back to, the, the, there is a destructuring of the mode of regulation uh, uh, of the US economy and the US government uh, that that doesn't seem to be substituted by anything coherent. Uh, so, I mean, the, the first part of the Bannon program, the construction of the administrative state, uh, is advancing, but there are still sufficient uh, tailwind that, I mean, the, the make the situation, uh, at least domestically, not explosive uh, uh, yet, and that uh, there will be some countervailing factor. I mean, people will see some money coming in on the tax reform and so on. And in a country that, I mean, was born in a tax revolt, I mean, still things that uh, help to buy time. Um, what will happen, uh, 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 let's say, after 2018 uh, remains a big question mark. We're, uh, 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 a lot of uncertainties. Yeah, and with that, I would also like to thank the chairwoman of the meeting for the great job she made and uh, keeping order and time. Yeah, we close the session. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank everyone for their patience, for their wonderful, wonderful contributions, and have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>